We believe that any highway option in this area, well, we know it, any highway option in this area is going to devastate Flamborough. We also believe we have something that shows the devastation a little better than what the Ministry of Transportation has shared so far. And I'll point out again, the route we think is still on the table. I'll also point out, it doesn't matter the route, every one of them is going to devastate Flamborough. It's just a choice of exactly where. Uh, we are still actually quite concerned about this whole option of a highway here. We don't believe it does anything to address our current issues at hand. We've studied these reports for close to 10 years now. We found them to be severely flawed, antiquated, and misguided. We don't believe the right question has been asked yet, and the right question is how do we increase mobility in the GTA? This information is from Metrolinx. This is congestion right now. I'll point out to you that in the area where this highway is going, down in the corner there in the Bay of Hamilton, it's not too bad, so I'll take you 25 years in the future. This is how it looks in 25 years. Visually, I still remain, we're mystified at how the highway will relieve that congestion in the GTA. If anything, it will further impact it. We have an issue with a process that took place in isolation rather than considering factors as a whole. Those inc other factors include things like the area in Flamborough, demonstrated, demonstrated by Don. From a, we commissioned a natural capital study that values the services from that area in this city at $1 billion, actually just shy of $1 billion annually. We think that deserves to be factored into this whole process. We think congestion in the GTA deserves to be factored in, and it hasn't. We also believe that this highway will devastate the agricultural area in Flamborough. It's interesting to know that agriculture, again, another big industry in this area, stands to be an even bigger industry, given impacts of climate change as they progress. And in this process, it's called community. So we're talking about something that is a life-sustaining element. If we were hungry, I think we'd have a great appreciation for the food we grow around here, as if it's a community thing, or perhaps a social tea. We think it delivers or consider, needs a lot more consideration, and we think the turnaround economic viability to this city deserves that consideration as well. We are in the process of putting forward a submission to the minister. Something interesting that has happened in the back and forth with the Halton Region Group is the minister has not only said, I'm not happy with what I'm seeing, he said, give me a recommendation. I want to see alternatives. Ironic, since we've been providing them for a few years, but we'll do it again, and we're putting it together now. I will share that our alternatives are going to include rail, light transit, um, high speed, or uh, LRT. They're going to focus on rail in trying to ease that congestion in the GTA. And we're going to suggest they literally stop the EPA process now. Stop it at number one. Take number two and phase two off the table. Basically, I've, I've fulfilled what I wanted to do today. I wanted you to know that there is a lot happening on this more coming in 2013, but I'd also like to say, as a group, our organization has enjoyed a, a good relationship with the cities of Halton and the region of, um, region of Halton, city of Burlington. Um, we haven't had as much interaction with Hamilton, and we would actually welcome that. And I will just leave that on the table for you, and I thank you for your kind consideration. Thank you, Susan. We do have a, a few questioners, and uh, Councilor Partridge and McCaddy. Councillor Bartridge. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Welcome, Sue. Nice Thank to see you, you again. Um, I guess, so one of my, uh, I have a few questions for you, but um, have you, your group, have you actually met with the Minister Chiarelli? No, we have not. Okay. Have you met with any staff? Of the Ministers? 
of either the ministers or MTO? The MTO, when we, um, Judy, when we had the, uh, when we had the Kojiko TV show we put together and whatnot, we actually did invite the MTO staff to come out and talk to us. They didn't at that time, they declined. The minister did tape a, an address. In regards to the last time we spoke to the MTO staff, that was when they made a presentation to the regional Halton Council. And we were at that point, and we did have a meeting with them afterwards. Okay, and thank you for that. Um, I was invited to the to yes. the Kojiko. Unfortunately, I yes. I couldn't make it, but I uh, I certainly appreciated the offer to be there. Um, and I guess so. My my only other question is, we have had uh, Councillor Pasuda and I over the past year and a half. We have had two community meetings mm -hmm. for, on this specific subject. Um, the one in uh, in Carlisle, there was close to 200 people there. You were there yourself doing the presentation. And uh, following that, we brought a motion forward, which was unanimously supported, mm -hmm. that um, uh, the mayor sent a letter and in talks with the minister request that Flamborough and North Burlington Escarpment be removed from the study area. So that's been done. What um, what has changed since we did all that? Actually, what has changed since then is that the minister has received the recommendation and he has asked for further input. Okay, thank and, you. Good and night. that is slightly different than anything we've ever had as a feedback before. Okay, and that, that's important, so thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. But I thought I also heard you say you don't know what those recommendations are at this point. Is that correct? I am surmising, and that is based on the interactions and the feedback I've received from the regional chair Carr and Mayor Goldring based on their conversations and staff and just in terms of, I, 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 I'm, it's a highway. I really don't know which one, and you're correct. And we did ask to meet with the minister as well. The minister did decline to meet with our group. Um, but he's not prepared to release that to us until 2013. All right, and, that's, and I think that's important for everyone to know as well. So you did request that meeting. You did yes. get declined. Absolutely. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, though, about surmising any kind of uh, recommendations until we actually know what facts we're dealing with. But I do encourage the work that you're doing, absolutely. Um, you know, there are challenges right now with the proroguing of the government um, mm -hmm. and everything else going on. Uh, um, can I just respond to that? Um, sure. Yes. The request has come from the minister now, so we are looking to respond now. The request for what, sorry? The request for alternatives has come from the minister now. And, and was that request made directly to your group? That was made to the uh, region of Halton and Burlington. Okay, thanks very much, Sue. I, I really appreciate all the work that you do and, and continuing to work with you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Partridge. We now have Councillor McCaddy. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thanks very much, Sue and, and Don, for coming here this morning. Uh, this is quite alarming to, uh, to see uh, the, uh, the options uh, that travel through Hamilton, through uh, Flamborough. All three uh, options are... Uh, are devastating the ones to the south, Mr. Chair, uh, along the Niagara Escarpment, and the ones further north through the uh, the wetlands and Flamborough, the, the uh, provincially significant wetlands. So I, I, I guess I'm just I think we're all a little bit confused because we haven't heard of this, uh, heard of the updates from from city staff or anyone else here um, at the city of Hamilton. Um, so thanks for for making us aware of this, Sue. Um, uh, but I just wanted to, Mr. Chair, just understand the process that has occurred to date, because uh, it sounds to me like the uh, the top political officials in Burlington Halton, the mayor of Burlington and the regional chair of Halton, have met with Minister Shirelli at the province, and uh, that is sort of our, our current source of intelligence. Uh, yourself having had discussions with the mayor uh, and uh, the regional chair. And that's where you're drawing your, your conclusions to date. Uh, is that right, to Sue? Uh, that's that these correct. three options uh, are the ones that are on the table. Um, the information we've drawn to date are from the chair and, and uh, Burlington mayor, and I believe the date they met was October 27th. So, so we don't know, as, as Councillor Partridge pointed out, we don't know for sure what's in this report. It's been uh, uh, kept uh, 
by the minister until 2013, I guess sometime uh, when he decides to release it. Uh, again, the intelligence from the, uh, the regional chair and the mayor is that they, the uh, minister is not happy with the MTO and, and the way that they've uh, formulated this report, which I think is good news for us, given the three uh, options that would uh, devastate uh, the environment in, in Hamilton, Flamborough. Uh, so I, I guess, Mr. Chair, the, the obvious question, I think, is that uh, where is Hamilton uh, on these, in these discussions? The, uh, the minister has decided to meet with uh, Halton and Burlington, and in fact, the impact on Hamilton could be quite a bit greater than uh, it, it is in Burlington and, and Halton. Uh, so, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, through you at the appropriate time, uh, either to uh, to city staff or Mr. Mayor, perhaps, uh, uh, what uh, what is our understanding from uh, Minister Shirelli or other sources at the province? Jeremy? Uh, through the Chair, uh, we tried to get the MTO to come in October, November to come in and present um, the findings. They weren't able to do that, so we're trying to still set that meeting up for the MTO to come in and talk to Council. We have an unofficial um, through uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor to, to uh, Mayor Bertina. Deputy Mayor, um, topic uh, not discussed with the, with the Minister. I mentioned to him that there's a continuing discussion around the GTA, and he nodded in acceptance of that. So I, my anticipation for this Council is that we'll, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, wait until we receive the information. Forward, it'll be an outline of how they may intend to progress. And until we have new information, we're still based on our old information and our council direction, which we passed. Uh, that still stands. That's the our council direction would be the document, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that we have in terms of our council. Councilor McCanny. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I seems to, or seems to me that we need to meet with Minister Shirelli and at least have the same level of knowledge as our colleagues in Burlington have, uh, Burlington and Halton. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable that they seem to know uh, more than we do. And uh, if I'm Burlington, I say uh, eliminate that bottom route and send it through Flamborough. That's my, uh, that's my comment as the mayor of Burlington or the uh, regional chair of uh, Halton, because that... Uh, that actually take, gets uh, me off the hook in terms of the environmental impact in Burlington. So I'm not sure we want to leave, uh, leave it up to, uh, to Halton and Burlington to take the lead on this. Uh, we're, uh, of course, they're good colleagues of ours next door, but uh, I think we need to represent Hamilton in this. And if they've already met with the minister and, and made their views clear, uh, I would suggest we need to do the same. Thank you. Okay, I believe um, we have now Councillor Clark and then Councillor uh, Pasuda and Parches for a second time. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Susan, good morning. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for attending today. Just some questions for clarification more than anything else. So what I heard you say is that you were told that the minister stated that he was not happy to his own staff in front of other people. No, that's not what I said. What did you say? What I said is that the minister has indicated, and my information comes from those meetings for, through the Burlington, that the minister is not happy. Whether or not he has said that in front of his staff or not, I have no idea. So was it a public meeting? No, it has not. So where did you state it? Which meetings? I'm trying to understand where, because it's unusual for a minister to make that kind of comment. It is. I understand exactly where the comment was made. The comment hey, Brad, was uh, made. I, we can barely hear you. I'm not sure if it's your mic or because you're not close enough. I have enough. a sore throat. I'll get oh, closer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Um, it's very unusual for any minister to state that they're not happy with something that their staff is doing in any public forum or to anyone that could become a public forum let alone in an EA. So I'm trying to understand where that statement came from. Okay, Susan, uh, do you have an answer to that? Um, I can respond to that. I'm, I'm fine to respond to that. And that you're absolutely right. It is not normal, which is a big reason why I'm here right now. Um, I, you are correct. I am relying on third party. I'm relying on regional chair Carr, and I'm relying on Mayor Gold. Ring. That I am relying on that. Um, I'm also taking into account what happened on the GTA West which is where they were looking at a new corridor and part of that process, and that's been reduced to uh, a widening of the 401. 
and that is at the same point with the EA process. So what we're seeing overall is some opening for movement here, which is another reason why I'm here. It's abnormal that we have this opportunity to present. This is no longer about the terms of reference and the technical, the technicalities pursuant to deciding about this highway. This highway was decided to go in 10 years ago, and the world's changed drastically since then. This is now political. This is, exactly, it, it, thank you, because it, it is. And it's about, is there, give me something else? And we do need something else, it's a good question. You, Deputy ask Mayor, you indicated that it's unusual for the minister to ask for alternatives from politicians. I don't know if he asked it from the politicians. He's, I think, you know what? He poised the question to politicians who have staff behind them. I think it's unfortunate that the alternatives weren't presented by his staff. Council Clerk. Okay, but his staff did the entire environmental assessment through mm -hmm. a public consultation looking at a number of things and the suggestion is that the minister is asking for alternatives mm -hmm. from Halton and... I think Susan acknowledged that it's hearsay more so than... I clearly acknowledge it's hearsay in third party. I will also point out every option up there is detrimental to Hamilton, even if it's the other. not officially asking for alternatives, Susan. That's, I think, the point that's being made. You know, my, my, my point is, and we're on different sides, you and I, on the issue, mm -hmm. um, but be careful what you're hearing, because right now it's pure politics, and they're not being, um, with the greatest respect, Minister Shirelli has indicated to numerous people that a decision won't be made until after 2013, 2014, which is long after the next election, mm -hmm. which is a problem. And if you recall, if you look at the original EA, um, the needs assessment, and then the completed EA, everyone was excited when the highway was off the table. And yet the Premier and the Ministers never once said publicly, clearly, the highway is off the table. As a matter of fact, it's in the document after a 20, 25 year period. And so you've got a situation where the facts are in the document and we're relying on politicians to try to speak honestly and truthfully and there's a great deal of political spin going on. So in your, if I was in your position, I'd be here and I'd be on guard. Um, but I'm not sure what the hell the truth is anymore. What I do know is this isn't the answer to anything we're facing today, so. Greatest respect, this council thought the highway was a great thing for this city. I recognize. And you do think so. I recognize that council has had an opinion contrary to mine. Okay, so let's, uh, Thank you. on that point, uh, we have uh, Councillor Pasuda next. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Marula. And welcome, Susan, and you are a constituent, a resident of my Thank ward. You. <laughs> to have you out today, and I know it can be a challenge at times uh, being here in front of council in the um, gallery. So, um, a, a couple quick questions and, and, and a comment too. But um, Don faded away there. I see he's rolling it up now. That's okay. Um, <laughs> as, as we look here at this map, and, and for me. For me, it, it's devastating to see the routes through uh, Ancaster, rural Ancaster, and up through Flamborough. And as you said, significant wetlands, recharge areas, and in between all that, uh, fine agricultural lands. Um, years and years and years ago, they widened Number 6 Highway, what is the county line between what was Wentworth at that time, now City Hamilton, and Wellington County. And it ended there, instead of coming up and around through the wetlands, making its way to the Hanlon to join to the 401, it just ended, and it's a bottleneck down there. And we just talk again of moving forward with that. Has there been any talk that you know of, of actually increasing capacity on Highway 6 up to the 401, within, including making the new route through the, uh, what I call the wetlands there, in Wellington County to the Hanlon because you've got on that map there uh, and, and Mr. Deputy Mayor on that map there we have where it comes to Highway 401 three three access points on there. I just want to be clear. Well we have three access points there and I'm looking at and then you got the number six highway where it goes up between the first two to your left there. I can't answer all of those directly for you. My understanding is the route on the far left closest to the Brantford border I believe that one's off the table. There was a, um, a communique issued by the MTO on that particular route. So that one is off, okay. And you've heard no talk of making Highway 6 wider than to the 401? 
Well, there's been discussion around that as it pertains to this particular recommendation. I don't know. And I think one of the, the issues here is trying to get through, as Councilman McCaddy knows very well, is through the Coots area. And uh, that's um, true. Burlington has been uh, on the forefront more than we have been about this issue. Uh, it, it hasn't, for me, to be honest, it hasn't escalated to the point where I think it's highlighted enough in the news since it's come back on board here, enough to put a lot of political pressure on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my feeling is if we have a change in government and whoever it should be, back in his, when he campaigned before, it was a big pressure to put the highway through and that would um, also increase the fact and the point that we may have a St. Mary's Quarry maybe back on the to, uh, so, so, uh, <laughs> just, so, I mean, we've, we've messed up here over the years as far as planning our cities and expanded. Finbrook is way out there. It's a new city within its own. Water down is there. We have not done the proper planning they've done in Europe to use public transportation. In your eyes, the way we have developed the city of Hamilton with, with building all over the place and spread out, what's the best way in your mind for the future to have a transportation Toronto and beyond? The first thing that... <clears throat> From our group's perspective, the first thing is to actually focus where the big priority problem is, which is However, as I, I said as well, Councillor Pasuda, we are putting together what it is we want to see. We've done a lot of work on it so far. I'm not ready to share that at this point when we actually have a submission and some clear ideas on that <clears throat> prepared and we have meetings on the go with other interested parties. <clears throat> I'm happy to share it with you. I may. And uh, I've heard lately the high, the high, high occupancy vehicle lanes on the, on the highways are, are not working like they should. Uh, there's talk of making them strictly for, for buses. What's your comment on that about the high occupancy lanes? You have to be able to get to where you're going. So if you're taking the GTA West East lines or the uh, West East line out of Burlington to Toronto, <clears throat> that's absolutely doable. If you happen to be going further north to Toronto, you simply don't have the option to do it. If you want to get people in the high occupancy lanes, that's great if you can get people to commute and you do see more and more of that. But the bigger issue is to give people an option to get them off the roads in the first place, relieve the congestion, up the number of trains we have, up the speed. And the one thing too, and we say focus on trains, and that's because a lot of the um, data we're looking at right now, one is a recent study in the States, indicates that the younger generations are actually driving less. They are looking for these options. We really don't have them here. As we're moving towards Toronto, if you have to be someplace, you have no choice but to drive. I go to Toronto too, and I love it when I can take the train. So more trains, faster trains, but people like trains too, oddly enough, but they don't like buses. KW, Waterloo, they actually did a study and they, they were getting, oh no, I want my car, I want my car. Then they went, they started talking to the younger generation, but they found out people like trains. And for whatever reason, there's that delineation and they don't mind taking a train. So that's where we see this, whatever shape and form a train is. And I'll also remind you, economically, one of the concerns Council did present was the cost to service the infrastructure that would be the result of sprawl. It's a lot cheaper to build trains. If I'm sitting in a farm uh, out in the fields, I actually kind of like the sound of a train going by. Don't like the buses so much. And I'll also advise even the own Pambina Institute recently, I guess it was 2011, did studies in regards to the particulate matter, the impact from trucks and cars and how, how it is such a major impact on um, carbon emissions and how trains, rail, that whole bit, not only does it pay respect to what we're doing to the future generations and the impact that that's having cumulatively, it will help relieve what's going on in the GTA. And it's not that we have trains everywhere. I don't expect a high-speed train from Rockton to downtown Hamilton. But what I would like is that hub. Let me get to the hub, and then I am happy to get on a train and, and sit on my computer till I get where I need to go. Thank you, Sue. 
Thank you, Don, and Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Pasuda. We have uh, Councilor Partridge and Clark for a second time. Councilor Partridge. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Sue, I just, uh, I have a question and then I just have a comment that I'd like to make. My last question is with regards to the MTO staff. Um, have they been in, in the past year and a half to present to Burlington Council, to your knowledge, or to Halton Region? I saw them at Halton Council Chambers and it was either August or September. All right, so they have been in recently and they have talked to Halton Region. They have. So I think um, what I would like to, to do is I will follow up hearing from our general manager of public works, uh, Jerry Davis, that they are working to get MTO to come in. I will work with uh, Jerry to see if we can move that forward. And um, I'll also follow up again with uh, Councillor John Taylor. Um, I meet frequently with the Burlington councillors, and we have spoken about this, but not within the you know the last couple of months. Um, so you know, I think it's certainly worth the effort to do that. I am concerned, though, when um, you know some of the information that you have been have been relaying to us is hearsay um, and coming from a third party. So it's not factual information, mm -hmm. and I'm really uh, want to caution anyone around the table to make any decisions until we have that factual information in front of us. So I do appreciate you coming in and Don as well. Um, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, Susan. Uh, Did you want to respond to that? There was no question. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Thank you. Uh, now we have Councillor uh, Clark and then McCaddy for a second time. Well, oh, one of the other aspects that was early on uh, dealt with and then one of the provincial ministers squashed it because of cost was uh, doing tunneling so that there's no damage to Lamborough, Burlington and all the rest of it, much like they do in Europe, so it could come out much further down the line. Mm -hmm. Has your group ever looked at that particular concept as an alternative since if they're talking about alternatives, mm -hmm. is one of the ones where the train, everything could go under the tunnel. That is based on the premise that a highway is needed from Ancaster to the 407, and I don't abide by that premise, which goes... Where's the train going to go? Where's the train? When we're... To go train. You, we need freight train. Most of the highway traffic is trucks right now. It's logistics. Actually, so. that's odd because, in fact, what happened at the MTO presentation in Burlington is that the councillors very hardly que they questioned the MTO on their data pertaining to goods movement. And what came out of it is that it's very anecdotal. <clears throat> they don't have any reliable data. And, in fact, council was adamant that they had overstated it and weren't really buying those facts either. So at that point, they asked the MTO staff to go back and look at that more closely. Um, <clears throat> the MTO did, they did that. It was John Sle they didn't really have the data because it comes over the highway and we track it the entire time. Metrolinx has been very clear on that. The, the data in regards to goods movement is not that good. It's highly questionable and the backup is at the border, which of course brings you to the, the whole border issue about which do you use, Niagara or of course Windsor, which they are expanding. Uh, I think we should have the MTO in here, include Mr. McQuaig. Let's really get down to this, and I'd enjoy the questioning of them. No problem. Thank you. Are, are you moving that at the appropriate time? Uh, I'll accept it now. Moved by Clark, seconded by Partridge, that we invite uh, Mr. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk. Okay, all in favor? Carried. And Council McCaddy. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to, to clarify the, uh, the hearsay comment, because I... I'm not sure I understand. Um, I, I thought I did, but let me just clarify. Um, Sue, uh, it seems to me that the source of this information that you're providing, uh, the information I'm referring to, is that uh, the minister is displeased with the MTO report uh, and uh, the, uh, the interactions with the minister come from uh, directly from the mayor of Burlington and the regional chair in Halton. So uh, I suppose that's still hearsay, Mr. Chair, but but I would suggest higher quality hearsay if, if, we're, if we're qualifying uh, hearsay. Okay, those yeah. are, uh, I, I wouldn't expect those uh, two politicians to lie. Um, uh, you never know, of course, but uh, 
Is, is that indeed where the, the source of the information is coming from? Because they're the only ones who have met with the minister on this topic, at least in uh, this room. Okay, uh, today. so may, perhaps you can just confirm who said what and where. The source of the information is the regional chair, Mayor Goldring. And may I also suggest they did issue, there was a press release issued. Um, they did issue, they tweeted there, there was actually info released by them after the meeting in the public realm. Make an official statement then accordingly. Regional Chair Carr. So again, not the minister, Regional Chair Carr, Mayor Goldring. I think okay. it's probably Council important Kennedy. for us to receive that information. Um, if you have it, Sue, or we can pursue it through other channels, the press release, that sort of thing that uh, that followed up. And Ms. Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, I chair the uh, the Bay Area subcommittee we've established with uh, Burlington and. And I'd like to add this item to the agenda at our next meeting, which sounds like it won't be till January. We're having a hard time connecting with calendar schedules. But I, I'd like to add this uh, item to that uh, particular agenda. Thanks. Do you want to move that uh, accordingly? OK, moved by McCaddy, second by Farr. All in favor? Carry. Madam Clerk, you good with that? Excellent. Uh, Councilor Bertino. Uh, oh, Mayor Bertino, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor and uh, members of committee and uh, it should be understood that there are lots of transportation groups that are having all the trucking industry and others who may be having conversations that are leading people to assume that some government policy is in place. Uh, the, the trucking industry will never give up on having this highway put through and so I, I think we need to be really careful, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that, that this chamber um, deal with hearsay and what third parties may say about what other people say. I mean, we've all been victims of that ourselves, and uh, I think the matter is fairly clear-cut. We have a position. The ministry has an official position right now, and there's new information coming along. So once we get that information, because remember, the information is not going to be, guess what, they're building a highway. So we've got lots of time to discuss the situation, and, and uh, the reason for uh, this little presentation is to suggest that there are plenty of conversations going on about such a highway, and they may not necessarily be official MTO or ministerial ones. Thanks, uh, Mayor Bertina, and Councillor Clark for a third time. I just wanted to thank Susan for coming in with the new information. Um, we can find out what the facts are. We're really good at that, and we make our decisions based on those facts. Partisan political comments that become seen as reality, we don't tend to deal with those things. We narrow it right down to the facts, and that's how we make our decisions. I appreciate the opportunity, and when you have gotten more facts, I look forward to coming back and talking about it some more. Thank you, Susan, and thank, thank you, Councillor Clark. So uh, moved by Clark to receive the presentation and seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, before we hear uh, from Enbridge, I will ask uh, the delegations to approach the podium to provide their presentations first. Uh, we will be waiting for Don McLean, who will be speaking on behalf of Professor James Quinn. That's correct. Good day, Mr. McLean. I'm the fill-in guy today, as you sort of kind of figured out here. Uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Quinn uh, wasn't able to uh, attend. Uh, he has given me his notes and his slides, and I hope that I can uh, uh, fairly represent them. You'll remember that I was in here before speaking on the Enbridge topic before, and I primarily was talking about climate change. Uh, a few things have happened since then, uh, particularly Hurricane Sandy that has focused some attention on that. Um, so uh, Dr. Quinn's, uh, and let me get some glasses on here. Uh, 
The, uh, the slide is of uh, the Enbridge uh, cleanup uh, still ongoing uh, after two years, uh, uh, the July 2010 uh, spill that took place in the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. Uh, I think the bill is somewhere around $820 million at this point, and the EPA recently ordered the company to go back and, uh, and do more work on it. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, comments here is just the Enbridge pipelines have failed and will continue to fail. Uh, the Polaris Institute uh, used Enbridge data to tally 804 spills between 1999 and 2010, 168,645 barrels of crude spilled into the environment, more than half the oil spilled by the Exxon Valdez spill. And uh, the toll on flora and fauna, including humans, is not clear but is substantial. The costs are real, the risks are high, the benefits go to big oil corporations and to those exporting the oil and gaining added value. And uh, that uh, slide is from the tar sands uh, specifically. This is uh, the, the route. Um, and uh, if I've got my notes straight, uh, the risks are ours, the benefits are short-term to oil companies, the costs are long-term and global, and one of those costs will be displacement of coastal peoples of the world. So uh, the red is line nine on this uh, map, uh, the uh, uh, orange part, uh, yellow orange part, I can never get color straight down to Portland, is uh, uh, not been formally uh, identified, but uh, is apparent that in a, in a previous application by Enbridge to uh, uh, their trailbreaker application to uh, export through Portland, Maine to markets abroad. Uh, so Dr. Quinn has, uh, has pulled out this uh, item from January 2011 on sea level rise, uh, a peer-reviewed study uh, published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, Physical Engineering Sciences section, and um, he has uh, highlighted a section from that, uh, uh, which uh, probably is worth reading uh, uh, based on our analysis, a pragmatic estimate of sea level rise by 2010, 2100 for a, a temperature rise of four degrees centigrade or more over the same time frame is between a half a meter and two meters. The probability of rises at the high end is judged to be very low, but of unquantifiable probability. However, if realized, an indicative analysis shows the impact potential is severe with the real risk of forced displacement of up to 187 million people over the century. That's 2.4% of the global population. Uh, and that's the line that he particularly wanted to emphasize, the real risk of forced displacement. Um, we are, uh, as in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, talking about uh, abandoning portions of New York at this point in New Jersey as a result of what took place there and what is likely going to keep on happening. Um, this is just a slide from the Australian uh, scientific organization on uh, the uh, various model prediction projections for uh, the expansion of the ocean. You can see they're quite varied, uh, but that 0.2 meters uh, in, in the uh, pink uh, bar is uh, at the lower end, uh, 0.2 to 0.6 uh, from thermal expansion, glacier melting, contributions to potential ice sheet dynamic processes add some more, and larger values cannot be excluded. This is uh, just last week from uh, St. Mark's Square in Venice. Uh, if you haven't been swimming in Venice recently, yeah, you can do it on the streets now. You don't have to go on the canals. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping by here. This thing does not want to do what it wants to do. Here we go. How far back will it go? There we go. So um, the, he's ended off this uh, presentation with uh, 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 an illustration on the Milgram experiment. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Milgram experiment. It was done in the early 60s, uh, and it was a, uh, um, uh, an attempt to try and determine uh, whether people who were saying that they did something evil because it was ordered for them to do it whether they would actually do it. And the, uh, the expectation at the time was virtually everybody will refuse to do this. But Milgram set up an experiment uh, where 
two students are, are taken uh, and they are given the role of either teacher or student. Uh, the teacher is instructed to give electric shocks to the student uh, when the student makes a m mistake and to increase the electric shock uh, quantity as more mistakes are made. Uh, and uh, the expectation was that students wouldn't go very far with this. In fact, uh, they went all the way to the maximum uh, in most cases. Uh, and uh, it was a, a shocking experiment. It was a suggestion that uh, we are very susceptible to following orders uh, and doing things which uh, somebody in authority is telling us to do. Uh, what uh, Dr. Quinn uh, suggests in terms of an analogy, and he, and he suggests that this is uh, an imperfect analogy, um, but uh, uh, he, he says um, the voltage was to be turned up with every wrong answer until the student, actually an actor, got to the point of having a heart attack after pounding on the wall, separating teacher and experimenter from the student. Most teachers kept ramping up the voltage despite the grave apparent impacts on the student. Um, and uh, he suggests you can go online to get more details on this, but the council could claim this is uh, the suggestion he has in terms of how this situation is set up, that on one side we have federal government which is in charge of all these issues, uh, uh, the one who has jurisdiction over pipelines and so on, uh, they are the uh, uh, experimenter, uh, the one uh, controlling the overall uh, city councils, the National Energy Board, the Ministry of Environment, other public uh, officials are in the position of being the one who's supposed to administer the electric shocks to the coastal peoples of the world. Uh, and what he's suggesting is we should have moral fortitude and say no, that this is wrong. And that's the uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Um, Councillor Clark has a question. Councillor Clark. How would you describe me? <laughs> well, I th I'm not sure how Dr. Quinn would describe you. I think what he's suggesting is that City Council is in the position of being uh, told that they don't have any authority over decisions like this, uh, which are clearly having impacts on a global scale and uh, that uh, you should just keep on doing what uh, you're supposed to do, which is uh, getting out of the way, in this case, keeping things uh, moving along. Uh, and that his argument would be that uh, uh, you have a, a moral duty to uh, look at this picture from its full, in its full uh, features and, and respond to that from a moral perspective. Feel free to tell Dr. Quinn that I find his analogy of the milligram experiment rather simplistic in this ever that we're dealing with. I do have a lot of questions for Enbridge when they come forward, um, but I do want to thank Don for coming forward on Dr. Quinn's behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Clark. No further speakers. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Appreciate your time. We have a motion to receive the presentation moved by McCaddy, seconded by Morelli. All in favor? Carried. Next is uh, Mr. Richard Rebel to provide information relevant to the Enbridge uh, pipelines issue. Welcome, sir. The floor Thank is you. yours. Is the mic on? It is indeed. Okay. Um, just for the record, my last name is Rebley. If you could imagine it oh, had sorry. a Oh, It's all right. If you could imagine it had a Y at the end of it, right? Um, I don't always mind that mispronunciation, Rebel. Sometimes it's useful. It's just <laughs> today, I don't feel like one. The floor is yours, Mr. Rebley. I'm going to start with my conclusion first. It is this, that the uh, General Issues Committee needs to explore every avenue it can to protect Hamiltonians from potential catastrophes caused by Enbridge Incorporated in connection with the flow of diluted bit bitumen through Line 9, part of which runs through environmentally sensitive rural lands of Hamilton. The way I arrived at this conclusion was by examining some of Enbridge's verifiable actions and inactions, starting with a, a spill from its Line 10. This is a pipeline that runs from Hamilton to Buffalo. 
This happened in Binbrook in 2001. According to a, a Binbrook resident, John McGreal, who is present today in the peanut gallery here, it took 12 hours for the company to shut off the flow. That pipeline, by the way, was only 29 years old, much younger than Line 9. That is an important point. The next spill on my list was the rupture of Enbridge's Line 6B in Michigan on July 25, 2010, my thinking being that surely Enbridge had learned something in the 11 years since 2001. I would like to stress that the 2010 spill need not have happened if Line 6B had been properly excavated and repaired in 2005, which was when Enbridge first discovered corrosion and cracks along the 43-year-old pipeline. It didn't. What did happen was that Line 6B ruptured, spilling one million gallons of diluted bitumen from the tar sands. The Tari bitumen contaminated 38 miles of the Kalamazoo River and sickened approximately 320 people, resulting in the evacuation and eventual purchase of 160 homes. According to a Hamilton activist, the late Maggie Hughes, who recently made a power presentation to Council on this same topic, some of those who sickened subsequently died. In July 2012, the United States National Transportation Safety Board, which I will herein refer to as NTSB, concluded that Enbridge, one, took advantage of weak regulations, two, tolerated a culture of deviance on safety, and three, failed to detect and properly respond to the largest and costliest oil pipeline spill in the United States history. When the pipeline ruptured, the company failed to respond to the emergency with either adequate manpower or proper spill containment methods. Instead of concentrating at the source of its spill, initial responders used booms nearly eight miles downstream. As a result, more contaminated oil, er, more oil contaminated more wetlands and waterways, resulting in an $800 million cleanup or five times more costly than any other accident. At the beginning of the emergency, Enbridge used the wrong spill technology at the wrong place and at the wrong time. It did not have adequate response on site, nor did local responders have access to Enbridge's response plans. Due to a series of repeated errors in Enbridge's pipeline control room, uh, the NTB the NTSB described the entire disaster an example of an organizational accident due to team performance breakdown. In fact, the company had a 10-minute rule that mandated that operators shut down a line showing a dramatic drop in pressure, but during the Michigan leak, operators systematically violated or ignored company rules as well as pipeline warning systems so many times over 17 hours that NTSB had to conclude that the company's control room suffered a culture of deviance. One of the things I'm concerned about is the lack of learning said Chairman Herzman of the NTSB, which is a much milder statement than I would have been inclined to use myself had I been in that position. After Enbridge's $800 million cleanup, pipeline lobbyists bragged that the company had scrubbed and polished the Kalamazoo River so thoroughly that the company had left the river cleaner than before the spill. Despite this claim, the United States Environmental Protection Agency saw fit last month to order Enbridge back to the site of the oil spill to clean up remaining pools of bitumen contaminating a 38-mile stretch of the Kalamazoo River. The $800 million spent over the two years it took to clean up, uh, to clean up 1 million gallons of oil that's 200,000 more than Enbridge originally reported spilled, was apparently not worth doing the job properly. And thus, my conclusion, 
This committee needs to explore every avenue it possibly can to protect Hamiltonians from potential catastrophes caused by Enbridge Incorporated in connection with the flow of diluted bitumen through line nine. And that is the end. Thank you, Mr. Rebley. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> Hearing none, may I have a motion? All motion to receive, moved by Pearson, seconded by Pesuda. All in favor? Carried. Oh, we don't have quorum. So we'll have to wait to receive your presentation, but um, we can move on. Many thanks, sir, for your, for your time. Thank you, folks, and have a good day. Okay, moving on, we have um, Mr. Matt Nash respecting Enbridge Line 9 Pipeline. Welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, is there a way that I can move this forward? Oh, I think there's a few more pieces just at the end of uh, my presentation, if it could move forward. It's here. Oh, thank so you. This is your, this is your presentation. Uh, I can use this. I have the <clears throat> same last uh, endpoint. Do you have here? No. To be I, I know this presentation, so I can. That up, that'd be great. All right, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, honorable councillors, concerned citizens, and uh, Enbridge representatives. My name is Matthew Nash, and I'm speaking on behalf of Hamilton 350 and Environmental Defense, who stand in opposition to uh, Enbridge Line 9 reversal based on uh, three things the type of oil to be pumped, the worn, though yet unknown, condition of the existing pipe, and finally, Enbridge's reputation for oil spills. First off, the type of oil to be pumped through the pipe will be Dilbit. Dilbit is more dangerous than light crude for three reasons. It is much more viscous. Viscous means that it's thicker. Dilbit will have to be forced through the pipe at much greater pressure. This greater pressure is further multiplied by the increase in pressure Enbridge demands for output. In fact, it's 40 to 70 times more viscous than conventional crude oil. And greater pressure will equal more spills. It's also uh, necessary to dilute Dilbit uh, with toxic substances to help it uh, flow. These include natural gas substances and volatile uh, petroleum products. It's 20 times more acidic than conventional oil, 10 times uh, more, uh, and there are 10 times more sulfur uh, content, according to the NRDC. Uh, why is this bad for a spill? Well, the mixed bitumen uh, and condensate separate in a spill. Bitumen sinks to the riverbed, which is 10 times as hard to remove as crude, while the toxic off-gassing condensate permeates the vicinity. Uh, the toxins uh, included uh, with a dill bit uh, are benzene and hexane, uh, which can affect the, the central nervous system. And as my last presenter said, it uh, has detrimental effects to human health, um, flora and fauna. Uh, it's also abrasive. Tar sands oil includes, as you may presume, uh, tarny, tiny shards of sand that act like sandpaper, which gradually wear down the pipe with its abrasion and heat. In fact, although newer, Alberta's pipelines suffer 16 times as many corrosion spills as other pipelines in the U.S. Additionally, the pipe is almost 40 years old and on its second reversal. This pipe is old and yet we still have no independent analysis of the integrity of the pipe. Can we trust a company to report defects that has a direct interest in not reporting any defects? Which brings me to my last point. Enbridge is a company with a reputation for oil spills and environmental devastation, the most recent in Kalamazoo on the Line 6. Enbridge dumped 1 million gallons of tar sands crude in the spill over a span of 80 kilometers, the costliest spill in American history. Um, citizens were left with toxic water, health problems, and a destroyed environment that is still being cleaned up. Do we sacrifice Lake Ontario, as well as all the infrastructure we've invested in to ensure clean, accessible water to Hamiltonians? 
I'm talking about the water treatment plant upgrade, Coots restoration, and plans for Randall Reef remediation that would all be jeopardized by a spill in Hamilton. This endeavor will not create jobs for Hamiltonians. They will not be building a new pipeline up to code, yet we will have to foot the bill for the inevitable spill. If you don't believe all the risks associated with the pipeline operated by Enbridge, I would like to leave you with a summary of the independent U.S. government investigative agency, the NTSB, which my last presenter uh, so eloquently put. In its report, the NTSB said that not only Enbridge was not only was Enbridge's response to the spill slow, 17 hours and 19 minutes, but the company knew at least five years before the massive leak, the pipeline was corroded and cracked. External corrosion and cracking caused the 471 kilometer pipeline to rupture, the NTB, NTSB said. 15,000 defects were identif identified in a 2005 report, but only 900 of those digs were actually, uh, sorry, 9,000 of those were actually dug up. Sorry, 900 of those were dug up. The report added there were pervasive organizational failures at Enbridge, and Enbridge twice pumped more crude, about 81% of the total release after the pipeline ruptured. So after the pipeline ruptured, Enbridge tried, tried twice uh, to kickstart it again, and they did, and that was 80%, 81% of the total release. It's not only uh, Enbridge that's at fault, it's uh, our re lack of regulations that are in place. Um, I'm speaking to the uh, regulations in the United States, but uh, as we all know, uh, with climate scientists being fired, uh, environmental assessment being, uh, you know, neutered um, and uh, pretty much taken off the books, um, we have a need to worry as well. So I'll leave you with this, delegating too much authority uh, to the regulated companies to assess their own risks and correct them is tantamount, tantamount to the fox guarding the hen house, Mr. Hurstman said in her closing comments to the NTSB report. Enbridge's plan would drive us to accept all the risks of the spill with no benefit, and that's the wrong choice. So line nine should not be reversed. So this is what you can do. Uh, I think we should send a letter to the MOE requesting environmental assessment because it, it crosses the uh, watersheds critical to the uh, water supplies in, 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 uh, in Hamilton and the rest of southern Ontario. Um, we should share this letter with other municipalities to request solidarity among municipalities. I attended uh, a, uh, a Line 9 uh, information uh, conference uh, last weekend and the big message was solidarity. Right now, as it stands, most people don't know about the Line 9 reversal and they know nothing about the risks. Enbridge is trying to force this through as quickly as possible before there is a, a front to, to stop it. So we have to uh, move forward to gain solidarity with our other municipalities and send a strong letter to the MOE requesting an environmental assessment. I believe there's only two that can happen per year, but this is something that we should explore all avenues. Uh, yeah, and finally, do what is morally right. Um, and the uh, information that I've gathered in this presentation uh, was from a number of sources. If anybody is concerned that uh, I'm not dealing with facts, I can certainly forward those to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Nash. We do have uh, questions, and Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and, and thanks, Matt, for coming this morning. Uh, I think it's going to be very important for Council to get the facts. Uh, you, you've uh, outlined some facts today, and Mr. Rebley uh, uh, referenced the NTSB uh, report as well. Uh, and uh, the motion that I'm going to move later on uh, builds on the previous uh, meeting we had uh, here on, on this question, on the uh, pipeline question, and has posed some questions to the National Energy Board uh, uh, talking about uh, pipeline integrity, uh, Questions of whether uh, Dilbit is in fact uh, more corrosive than the standard uh, crude oil and and things along those lines And I'm I'm not sure the National Energy Board is going to respond to Hamilton Well, that's a probably a bit of a question mark, but nonetheless we'll we'll need to assemble that sort of uh, information yes. in order to uh, to be able to speak uh, uh, with intelligence on the issue and Speaking to Mr. Rebley's last comment uh, if, we're, if we're about protecting Hamiltonians and Hamilton environment 
uh, and we and we're supposed to, should be taking steps in that way. We need to do that with the facts. So, Mr. Uh, Chair, I, I'd certainly ask you, Matt, and perhaps Environmental Defence, uh, to, to please send uh, that information to us. Uh, uh, the NTSB report uh, would be important, I, I anticipate, and other mater <coughs> materials that you may have referenced today, uh, or uh, maybe looking at some of those questions that we'll be posing to the National Energy Board. Uh, Enbridge will have some thoughts on those, of course, uh, being in the business. Um, no doubt uh, you will as well, and there, there may be university professors and studies out there that yeah. we're not aware of. We're, we're city councillors dealing with umpteen million issues. Our city staff are not experts in the pipeline area. So we are going to rely on Enbridge, uh, uh, groups like Environmental Defence, uh, uh, National Energy Board and others to become informed. So uh, certainly feel free to send uh, as much information, Mr. Chair, as, as you'd uh, feel is appropriate to uh, assist us in our decision making here. Great. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that uh, request to uh, inform uh, uh, Hamiltonians in general, but most especially the councillors who uh, can make these critical decisions to uh, stop uh, Line 9 or at least uh, assess the potential impacts in our community. Um, and uh, before I go, I'd just like to uh, just uh, comment on what uh, Mr. McCaddy just said about uh, you know the the, cross, the cross, corrosive abil um, characteristics of of Dilbit, uh, its viscosity, um, and also uh, the uh, amount of sediment in, which causes abrasion. Uh, I, I'm almost positive that uh, Enbridge is going to use uh, their own. Uh, facts which are derived from, from this paper, uh, which I can send to you as well. Um, this uh, is prepared by the Alberta, Technolo Alberta Innovates Technology Futures. Um, it's, a, it's quite a long paper. It looks uh, official. It's not peer-reviewed. It's not scientific at all. And in fact, it, it says uh, that um, although there are reasonable efforts to make this uh, work conform to scientific uh, principles. Uh, it makes no representation uh, and and warranties uh, with respect to the reliability, accuracy, or validity, or fitness of the information analysis and conclusions remained in, contained in the report. So this is uh, the information that you'll be getting from Enbridge is basically for entertainment pur purposes only. It's not scientific. Um, and also the people who funded this, uh, which says that Dilbit is not corrosive, it's not abrasive, and it's not thick as sludge. Uh, the people who funded it uh, are these two people, uh, Eric Newell, which uh, served as the, he the uh, president of St. Crude Canada for 14 years, sorry, he was the CEO, and Kathleen Sendall, who's the vice chair of this organization, um, was the president of, um, of Petro Canada, the natural gas division. Um, so. Their, their facts are going to differ, uh, but uh, I urge you to uh, think carefully about uh, who's actually telling the truth and who has uh, more to gain and, and vice versa, who, who has a lot to lose by uh, not knowing uh, the truth. So I'm going to do my best to uh, inform, to the best of my ability, uh, city councillors and Hamiltonians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nash. May I have a motion to receive Mr. Rebley's uh, presentation and Mr. Nash's, moved by Colin, seconded by Morelli. All in favor? Carried. Many thanks, sir. I would uh, now call on uh, Ken Hall, Senior Advisor, Public Affairs, Enbridge Pipelines Incorporated, to approach the podium to provide their presentation. Sorry. Oh, my apologies. We have the additional Additional delegation, Councillor McCaddy moved, and his name being Councillor McCaddy? His name? Oh, there he is. Welcome, sir. Can you just state your name for the record once you get to the mic? Welcome. The, the floor is yours. If you can just state your name. Okay, my name is Iwatne uh, Heatne, I'm Haudenosaunee, Kusinageta, uh, Skori. Uh, most people know me as Wes, Wes Elliott. 
Okay, I would like to start first that uh, the honor of the Crown is at stake here. And anything that happens with uh, Native people, especially with the Confederacy, uh, the honor of the Crown is at stake. And that includes here. And one of the things that uh, in dealing with honor, it is not proper to lie, especially to your city council in these papers here. And I specifically point out to a lie that's out here read it uh, read in the conclusion it says outlined above no project specific concerns have been raised so far from our stakeholders holders and aboriginal communities that is a bold-faced lie last year our confederacy through hdi the Haudenosaunee development institute sent a letter to the neb outlining our concerns and that's a public document that is on their website and that has been forwarded to embridge outlining it. It was a three-page document, and I will forward it here for your concerns so you can see it too. But it outlines in three pages our concerns concerning this project. So honor of the crown and honor and lies right before you, I'm telling you that's a fact. And so this is a bold, blatant lie that they gave to you, period. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that this council here has experience and has set a precedent in dealing with our Confederacy. You have the uh, Red Hill Valley Agreement that was negotiated between Hamilton and our Confederacy. So the, uh, pro uh, the precedent has been set. What uh, I'm going to suggest is that this council deals with our Confederacy again concerning your concerns and concerning our concerns on this pipeline so that we can formulate a plan together. In return, you also have concerns concerning contaminants at the airport that you're having problems getting funding from uh, the federals, the feds. We can help in that too because we have the 1701 treaty. Now the 1701 treaty was confirmed in Ontario courts in 2008 with the Ireland George case versus the Crown. In that case, the judge specifically states that that specific treaty, as outlined in 1701, is uh, recognized under Section 88 of the Indian Act that it is a valid treaty. Being that it's, it is a valid treaty, they also stated that the treaty supersedes Ontario legislation. Those are key points on there. So the opportunity for us to work together, not only on Enbridge, but also on the contaminants at the airport is real. And I suggest that we start looking forward to planning on working together to do this. And I also would like to thank Enbridge for putting all this information outlined in here because it outlines all the municipalities that we could work together with, okay? And we're looking at this council helping in that way and in doing so. Uh, you look at what's happened in British Columbia. In British Columbia, the municipalities have partnered with the native communities there. Why is it, it happening here? We have an opportunity to start working together with our municipalities, your municipalities in this area, and with our confederacy. Now, also it states in here, that they have talked with the Iroquois Caucus. Now the Iroquois Caucus is a collection of band councils. They are not traditional, they are not the Confederacy. They have had no talk with our Confederacy. Uh, the last update I had was Saturday. And they had no contact with our Confederacy through the HDI, none whatsoever. Uh, so that's the updates that I have to give, give to you. But the possibilities are real for this council to once again work with HDI and our Confederacy to do something positive, to do something positive of coming up with a plan concerning Enbridge and to come up with a plan concerning your funding. We can work together and that's what we want to do is start working together. So I bring this idea to you and present this idea to you as possibilities. We have many possibilities that we can work together on and that's what I'm looking forward to is working together with you and our confederacy on the possibilities that we can move forward. 
Uh, I'd like to turn this over now to Ruby. Thank you, sir. Welcome, ma'am. Hello. I think I'll pull us down quite a ways. <laughs> it's always that way. Well, my name is, um, uh, what is it again? <laughs> I'm thinking of my Mohawk name, Nagotala. But my name, my uh, whatever name is Ruby Montour. I'm a Mohawk. And we have been going to different places and we've been fighting against all the stuff that's been going on in our territory. And we would like to let this gas company, oil company know that we're aware of what they're doing and we don't like it. We look at the reserve, however you say that name, what is it? Okay. Have you ever seen what they've done to them? Well, you got grandchildren or children, do they go outside with a mask on to play so that they can breathe? That's what's going on up there. Oh, Sarnia. In Sarnia. They've got the pipes surrounding the reserve to the place where the animals that they have always uh, used for food cannot get through. And when they go out to get them, they taste badly. The air is horrible to smell. Cancers is outrageous in a community. Is that what we deserve? I say this way. The disaster that can happen from this oil being reversed is catastrophic. It's going to be a horrible, horrible mess. And it's not just going to affect us. It's going to affect everybody. This is why we all need to really stand up and say, this is enough. Our life is worth more than their money. They can't buy our health. They can't buy the happiness of our families and the communities. We have a right, along with you, to live in a healthy manner. Now. These pipes are old. They're old. And they're willing to, to jeopardize us so that they can make more money. They don't care how that's going to affect us if anything goes wrong with those pipes. And you can be sure that something will go wrong because they're not supposed to do it that way. I think that if we stand together, and I want these people to know, really know, that we are paying attention to what you're doing and we don't like it and if you think we can't do anything about it you are badly mistaken because yes we can we're tired of being walked over and your idea is pushed on us whether we like it or not but we don't like it and you shouldn't like it either the wildlife is paying for all of this oil. Only a few of them are taking the bucks to the bank. Well, the rest of us go on a wing and a prayer that nothing will go wrong. If we got a backbone, it's time to use it. And it's time to let these people know this is not acceptable. And they need to come at us with a different view. We have people who are following this closely because of the abuse that's going on on these other reserves. And when I say abuse, I mean abuse. Send some of your people up there and take a look at how those people live. They're right in the middle of all those pipes. The odor is terrible. I'm mighty sure you wouldn't want that for your family. So why should we? Maybe they think the Grand River is so bad off now that nothing can save it. <laughs> they could be right on that one. But they're still not going to do it. And we want to be informed. There's people on the reserve who have never been informed about what's going on. Then they put in here that we've been informed. 
They take six nations and they ball it together like a snowball. There's more entities to us than that. And there's a great deal of us that have never been consulted in any way, shape, or form. And that better be reversed. They can reverse that. We'll allow that. They're going to deal with us one way or the other. They can either make it in a nice way or they can make it in a hard way. It suits me either way. Thank you for having us. And I think that uh, when we open up our eyes to what's going on around us, the destruction that can happen, and the destruction that's already going on in some of the, the nations of, of, of the natives. It's already happening, and it's not far away. I hope that you will investigate this sorely, because we really need you to do that, for the sake of your people as well, and for all the people up and down the Haldeman track. Thank you. I wish to uh, add a second comment in on here, and that is we are looking at peaceful ways of doing things. As we know what happened in Caledonia that was not peaceful, it was violent. There is the real possibility that violence could happen over this because the Haudenosaunee people will not permit this to go through without proper consultation and accommodation. They will not. So the real possibility exists that violence could erupt somewhere along this line. I'm here to say that I want peace and I want to protect my people. And I would like to have to see us have the opportunity to work together with this council, other councils along the way, that we can work together in a peaceful way to show that peace is the way that peace can be done. So I just want to uh, remind you to, uh, of that, that this is a real possibility and it's peace that must prevail. Thank you. One more thing, please. All these places that, uh, of the nations that have, have been, uh, that's on here, that have been uh, written here that they've been informed of what was going on, I plan to get a hold of them. I plan to get a hold of the Mohawks and see how they feel about this. They weren't called warriors for nothing. So we'll find out how they feel, and we'll find out how truthful they actually can be, which is probably nothing I'm going to be surprised about. Also, too, is the band councils do not have any representation over our land or over our treaties. The 1701 was made with our Confederacy, not with band council. The Iroquois caucus is all band councils. They have no authority towards any land or towards any treaties, none whatsoever. Those other communities, Iroquoian communities that they have contacted, all run through the Iroquois Confederacy. They're all members of the Iroquois Confederacy. And the traditional people will have a voice. And it's, you should be, uh, remember too that in our community at Grand River, we have a band council also too, but it's only 5% of the people vote. Only 5%. That's 95% of our people don't vote for that system. We are a traditional government. We've been there. You've dealt with us. You have agreements with us. So keep that on your mind too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion? Oh, before you do that, Councillor um, Thank you, Deputy Clark, Mayor. And then Councillor Collins. Just want to first off thank our, our brothers and sisters who we have worked with very closely on a number of projects for the last decade. Um, and I know the staff in Hamilton, the councillors, and, and the citizens have learned a great deal. Um, I know I've learned a great deal in terms of who you should be speaking to and what's the proper process. I have to confess I'm a little bit naive at the moment and I'd like to ask a couple of questions if you don't mind. As I understand it, the 1701 treaty that you're talking about with the Iroquois Confederacy, that was the, the NANFA treaty, that's the one we're NANFA. talking about? Yes. Okay. And I, I know we've worked in, in terms of bilateral discussions and working together as a group under, an, under almost like a memorandum of understanding between the Confederacy and the City of Hamilton. Um, have you ever worked or has anyone worked with the Nanfan Treaty where they would have a friend of the court with the Confederacy? So if you're going to be challenging something in court under Nanfan, normally it's the Confederacy that would do that work. In 
this case, it sounds like you're suggesting that there's a possibility that Hamilton could be a friend of the court and work alongside the Confederacy. Is that what I'm understanding, or did I misunderstand? That's what I'm looking at. Uh, further talks along that line would be very beneficial. I cannot make any statements here It's as far as HDI concerned, but I'm looking forward to opening up those talks between this council and our Confederacy. Now may I, uh, Deputy Mayor, also ask, has the Confederacy de determined, um, there's a number around us that, that are looking at the proposal by, by Enbridge right now and, and the 40-year-old pipe, et cetera, et cetera. Has the Confederacy looked at possible responses if that pipe was ripped out and brand new pipes with brand new equipment was placed in? Have you contemplated that at all, or is that something that we would have to have those discussions with the Confederacy at the time? At that position there, it would be up to Enbridge to enter into talks with our HDI, yes. which they have not. And uh, so a further speculation as far as what may be done is fruitless at this point until negotiations have started. So to be clear, though, because I read through the the responsibilities of the National Energy Board and the act that created it. Um, the proponent, in this case Enbridge, through the National Energy Board has an opportunity to, in essence, pay tariffs uh, to landowners like yourself for the pipelines going through and the nuisance of it. That has not been contemplated with the Confederacy at all? Nothing has been contemplated because no talks have been entered into at all. They have not contacted them. Um, thank you for your time today. It's been very enlightening. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Council Clerk. Uh, Council Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, and as you uh, know and Council knows, I've had the uh, privilege of serving on the Joint Stewardship Board with our Haudenosaunee neighbours for the last uh, number of years. And, and I think, as Wes and Ruby note, um, our strong relationship that we've had with the, uh, our Six Nations uh, neighbours and Haudenosaunee neighbours is... Uh, is due in large part to the strong lines of communication that we've had between our two communities. And I think it was West through your presentation where you suggested that we might want to meet with the Confederacy, the Confederate Council and, and Chiefs and, and, and to discuss not just the pipeline issue, but I think we have a number of issues that we share between our two communities, whether it's the mid-pen that was here this morning. Of course, we've dealt with Red Hill. We've been very successful with uh, Councillor McCaddy's efforts as Chair of the Conservation Authority to talk about hunting rights in the Dundas Valley and, and how we... Um, resolve that issue, which was an issue that involved not just our, our Haudenosaunee neighbours, but the entire City of Hamilton community. So I think we have a strong track record of, of, uh, of working alongside um, our neighbours, and I, I think Wes's suggestion of maybe meeting in, uh, with our, our neighbours in an informal setting, uh, maybe a, a, a night between or, or a, an afternoon uh, meeting between our council and, and the, count, the Confederacy Council, um, I think would make go a long way to maybe flush out some of these um, issues that have been raised today, not just with the pipeline, but as I just mentioned, there are three or four other issues that we've dealt with over the years with a, su a successful conclusion to many of them. I, I think, Wes, your idea is a good one, and I would like to formalize that if we could. Maybe if we can direct uh, Mr. Murray, who has uh, a good relationship again with the Chiefs, to, um, to contact uh, our Haudenosaunee neighbours to set up a, uh, an informal meeting between our two communities and sit down and, and speak to... to uh, to them about these issues and others that might be on the horizon as well. Okay. If I could at the appropriate time, yeah. Mr. Chairman. So, so moved that. by Councillor Collins, and actually this is the appropriate time, so moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Clark. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much, uh, sir okay. and ma'am. And uh, may I have a motion to receive the presentation moved by Partridge, seconded by Pasuda. All in favor? Carried. <laughs> now I would like uh, to call on Mr. Uh, Ken Hall, Senior Advisory, uh, Public Affairs, Enbridge Pipelines Incorporated, to approach the podium to provide their presentation. Accompanying Mr. Hall are Graham White, Manager of Corporate Communications, <laughs> Trevor Grams, Director of Integrity Management, Scott Ironside, Director of Integrity Management, Marjorie Folks, Senior Counsel, Regulatory Affairs, and Franz Kruger, Operations Supervisor, Westover Terminal. Welcome everyone, the floor is yours. Uh, 
our presentation. Good morning, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Mr. Mayor, members of committee. Uh, on behalf of Embridge Pipelines, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> to speak to you here this morning. Uh, as has already been identified, I have a number of my associates who have traveled from Calgary to participate in this presentation today. Uh, I would humbly request that the committee consider providing Enbridge with uh, additional time so that we may provide you with a thorough discussion of some of the topics that have been raised here this morning. Uh, I understand that due to policy constraints, and I do understand the constraints of your agenda, that we have been asked to hold our comments to five minutes. Uh, however, uh, if it would be possible for that period to be extended, we would certainly appreciate it. I, I personally have no problem with it, and uh, I presume, Councillor McCaddy, you're going to move that, seconded by Councillor Jackson to allow for that. All in favor? Carried. And the button here is. That's right. Now you have six minutes. Yeah. You should say all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I I think they'll be reasonable in their approach. <laughs> um, I would like to begin uh, by providing just some quick uh, overview facts on the statute of this project and the scope of what this project consists of. Uh, the slide behind me obviously uh, is an indication of the kinds of concerns that can be raised and often come forward uh, when a pipeline company such as Enbridge announces a project like the Line 9 reversal and the capacity expansion for our pipeline. Um, I'm trying to keep these comments brief because I really believe the focus of our discussion this morning needs to be on the integrity of our pipeline and our assets. It's certainly been challenged here this morning. Um, this pipeline project revolves around the idea of transporting Canadian crude to Canadian refineries located in eastern Canada. The pipeline will carry predominantly light crude at the request of our shippers. Uh, this particular project services the needs of three refining companies in eastern Canada, Imperial Oil, which is located at Danacoke, Suncor, which is located in Montreal East, and the Ultramar facility, which is located across the St. Lawrence River from Quebec City. These shippers have asked us to send them a variety of crude oils, but their predominant demand to this point has been for light crude, not diluted bitumen. The pipeline application, which we will file to the National Energy Board at the end of this month, will be worded to allow Enbridge to ship a variety of crudes, light, medium, and heavy, which by definition would include diluted bitumen, to provide flexibility moving forward to service the needs of our customers. All of the shipments of oil received on our pipeline system must meet criteria set forward in our tariff agreements. There are conditions imposed by the National Energy Board on the quantity of contaminants, if you will, to use that term, that can be present in the oil. We have heard that there are comments made that this oil contains sand. This is not the case. Such impurities must be removed from the oil prior to introduction into the Enbridge pipeline system. We are talking about transmission lines, which are main lines used to transport crude products to refineries. These are not gathering lines located in the oil sands in Ontario, or excuse me, in Alberta. So to use a term that these crudes contain sand simply is inaccurate. <coughs> Nothing is more important to Enbridge than the integrity, the safety of our assets. Nothing is more important to Enbridge than the safety of the communities through which we operate and the environments through which our pipeline passes. This is job one for our company like it is for all transport energy transportation companies. We continue to upgrade and maintain our assets. We do not feel that the age of Line 9 is a particular point of great concern. If we maintain our assets in operating condition, the age of the pipeline really becomes irrelevant. It's not about how old it is, it's about how well you take care of it. As has been mentioned this morning, 
there is an indication to you that there will be an increase in pressure on this pipeline. This is inaccurate. There will be no increase in the maximum operating pressure of Line 9 related to the, the reversal of the project. The product will not be heated in the pipeline, as, as has been mentioned in previous media articles that have circulated. There is no intention to change the operating temperature or pressure of Line 9 associated with this project. And in fact, we are returning the pipeline back to its original direction when it was first put into service in 1976. This pipeline was constructed at that time and the mandate of the Pierre Trudeau government to provide Eastern Canadians with access to Western Canadian crude because of the pending oils embargoes that were taking place with offshore oil producers during the 1970s. The pipeline was reversed in the mid-1990s as offshore oil production ramped up and became cheaper for Eastern Canadian refineries to purchase. We are now seeing market conditions where the exact opposite is the case. The differential price on a barrel of Western Canadian crude versus offshore crude is about $25 per barrel. So to use the example of the Suncor refinery in Montreal East, a represented savings of $1.6 million a day for that refinery could be achieved through greater access to Western Canadian crude. The reality is that this provides a level competitive marketplace for refineries located in Eastern Canada who are currently operating at a, a reduced competitive, from, from a reduced competitive spot in the global markets. So again, Enbridge is in the business of transporting energy. We're doing this to meet the needs of our customers, to maintain the longevity of the refineries located in Eastern Canada. I would now pass the podium over to my associate, Mr. Trevor Grams, who is the director of our Integrity Infrastructure Program, who will address some of the issues that have been raised about the integrity of our pipeline. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir, and welcome to you, sir. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I will uh, try to be respective of your uh, time this morning. Uh, we have distributed a very large uh, presentation uh, document. I'll go through what I believe are the uh, most focused points within the integrity area. Um, and then I'm sure we'll have ample questions where we can explore other areas of concern. Uh, first of all, covering the facts around corrosivity, um, there has been lots of claims uh, with respect to dill bit being more corrosive than uh, traditional uh, crude oils. Uh, that has not been substantiated uh, through our information. Um, corrosivity is normally tied back to the level of water in the oil and certainly uh, water is more common in our gathering system pipelines uh, up to a 50 percent level. However, in our transmission lines, uh, our regulations and the parameters we set for our assets uh, keep that at a 0.5 percent uh, limitation for a combination of both sediment and water. And those are the two factors that predominantly lead to internal corrosion in the pipelines. Um, we have been transporting crude oil since 1968 and we exceeded the uh, 100,000 uh, barrels per day uh, threshold back in 86 uh, with Dilbit. So we do have lots of experience in transporting that product. Um, we have not experienced an internal corrosion failure on our mainline system. So contrary to some of the other information that you've received, that has not been found to be the uh, the leading cause of, of a uh, release incident. And back in uh, February 2011, just as a reference, uh, the Alberta Energy Resources Conservation Board released uh, a statement that the diluted bitumen is as safe to transport as crude oil. In addition to that, uh, NACE, which is a uh, North American uh, corrosion engineering uh, organization, uh, is dedicated to the, the study of corrosion, has more than 16 studies dating back over 20 years to address uh, internal corrosion within pipelines, and none of those studies found any evidence to determine that diluted bitumen was more corrosive than conventional crude. In addition to that, uh, through PHMSA, who was under order of the U.S. Congress, 
has been asked to pursue an additional new study uh, for the corrosivity of uh, diluted bitumen. Those results are expected in 2013, and that work is being performed by the Academy of Science in the U.S. Uh, studies and evidence clearly demonstrate there's no more risk of corrosion in pipelines carrying diluted bitumen than conventional. I think I've made that point clear. Uh, and certainly we have uh, plenty of experience, uh, as do some of our other peer companies, um, with moving uh, diluted bitumen in pipelines. How do you manage corrosion in pipelines? I think it's important that we share some information in that respect as well. Um, corrosion can be both on the inside of the pipe as well as on the outside. Inside being caused by uh, moisture and uh, solid content. And uh, how do we explore, how do we control that corrosion should it exist? Uh, first of all, tight constraints that all products shipped on our pipelines go through laboratory testing to make sure they're absolutely within the ranges provided and contractual arrangements with each of our shippers. In addition to that, um, if there are any risks of contaminations in the lines, we use cleaning pigs uh, to move any impurities that are found in pipelines, or if a line is uh, stagnant for any period of time, we run cleaning pigs to make sure nothing's developed in the pipeline during that period. Uh, in addition to that, we can also inject corrosion inhibitors uh, into pipelines uh, to reduce any impact if the line is in a stagnant mode. For any period of time, the corrosion inhibitors again reduce any potential impact of corrosion on the inside of the pipe. We also have cathodic protection and coatings that uh, control and resist the external areas of the pipe to corrosion. In addition to that, like all good uh, uh, pipeline companies, we continue to pursue and invest in advanced new methods and technologies for the detection and management of corrosion, as well as any other threats to our pipeline system. As my uh, colleague Ken has already mentioned, pipeline safety and the safety of public and the workers and the protection of the environment are our top priorities. Uh, we continue to work towards a goal of zero pipeline incidents, and we, rec we recognize there has been incidents in the past, but we continue to work towards a goal of zero, and we have made several significant improvements since the uh, July 2010 time frame to continually show growth and improvement in our systems, the control of our pipelines, and the methods we use to move energy safely. Uh, our pipeline system is also closely monitored by a state-of-the-art control center located in Edmonton that operates on a 24-hour-a-day basis, seven days a week. Over the last decade, we've transported over 12 billion barrels of crude oil safely delivered with a record of 99.99%. We've used that uh, information in past uh, presentations as well. Uh, we, we continue to, to deliver uh, and strive to have 100% safe delivery of all of our products and ensure that we have the prevention of all spills. As mentioned, the Marshall, uh, Michigan spill of 2010 highlighted the importance of the goal of zero in both our pipeline and our facility integrity programs, and we reorganized some functional areas to create greater focus to ensure that we have responsibility for both the pipeline and the facilities along the pipeline. According to the NTSB final report, I think this is important to note, internal corrosion did not contribute to the release. Following uh, the Marshall incident, Enbridge has also substantially increased our integrity management spend. And dollars don't necessarily aren't the most important thing, but I think it is one of the things that people look for. Are you properly investing in your people, your systems, and the methodologies to control your business to protect you against future incidents? And we have increased that spend substantially. Uh, for inline inspections, we are now running 170 line, inline, 175 inline inspections have taken place since the beginning of 2011 and nearly 3,000 pipeline inspections 
or excavations during that same period of time. I'll talk specifically here in a few minutes about line 9B, uh, the reversal project. Um, 15 of those 175 inline inspections have been uh, conducted on line 9B itself. Just in general, our integrity management system, our approach, we start off with planning, so that determines the inspection uh, criteria and also the frequency, the mitigation requirements of what we need to do and what threats we look for. Every line is specific. We implement that by following through on the inline inspection uh, activities and then followed up as well by, by doing field inspections. Most people will call those dig sites where we actually go out and physically investigate the pipe at different locations. We assess the performance, so we do a comparison of what we find in the field directly as well as with what we find with the uh, inline inspection tools. And we continue to look for opportunities to improve both ourselves as well as with the vendors we use to support our business in inline inspection and the analogies and the algorithms they use to interpret the data they receive. Inline inspection. It is a highly sophisticated industry. I want to draw a comparison to uh, what we're probably more familiar with, which things like an MRI. In days gone by, the best you could receive was an x-ray. And then technology kept improving and improving. And now it's amazing what you can see with an MRI as far as the human body goes. Well, that same technology is applied in pipelines. So through the series of different applications of ultrasonics, uh, magnetics. We are looking for corrosion on the inside of the pipeline, the outside of the pipeline. We're looking for any potential for cracking circumferentially or longitudinally. We're looking and capturing all the data around any dents that the pipeline may have, as well as whether the center line of the pipeline changes from one run to the next run. So has there been any stress or settling or erosion that's caused movement of the pipeline between ILI runs. All of that data is collected. Every series of data is compared to a previous set of data. So you get not only the absolute of the number, but you get a comparison to what you've seen in the past. So that's an extensive amount of data collection, and it takes an advanced set of knowledge to understand and interpret. So that's why we use the best of the companies that are available in industry support us through what we call master service agreements. And we have those in enabled with all the major ILI vendors in North America. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of value in repeating inspections. So we do repeat inspections on intervals that allow us to understand whether there's been any changes in that pipeline and its condition from one inspection period to the next. In some cases, uh, the tools will see a feature that we require uh, further inspection on, and we call that a feature of interest. When we find a feature of interest, we then go into the field and actually do a formal dig and excavate the area. We'll remove the coating and expose the external of the pipe and do a direct assessment of the pipe using handheld uh, uh, tools and methodologies that have been in business for many, many years. We'll then compare those physical measures as well back to the ILI information we've already received. Through that analysis, we'll then make a determination whether what we found is what we expected or not. And we do what we call unity plots where we compare all the data we receive from the ILI to all of our physical data and look for a one-to-one -one comparison or unity. That gives us greater clarity and greater knowledge as to whether or not the science of the inline inspection tools are working properly. And they are detecting the features and sizing each of the features appropriately. Once the, once the pipe is excavated and exposed, then a decision is made as to whether or not the pipe needs to be uh, repaired or mitigated in any way. And in some occasions, we'll apply a sleeve which is a welded additional piece of pipe on the outside of the pipe. Normally, we go joint to joint. So that's a 40-foot or longer section of sleeving on the outside of the pipe to completely encapsulate an area if we have any concerns. 
So in essence, you've made the pipe wall significantly thicker in that area. And then the pipe is recoded using the latest coating technologies in those areas. Um, all of those dig sites are normally processed through uh, uh, local uh, permitting uh, processes and certainly in, uh, in partnership with the landowners uh, where those uh, dig sites are located. Specifically on line 9B, as I mentioned before, we've run five different ILI technologies or inline inspection technologies in that section of pipe from northwest over uh, up to Montreal. Um, they include crack detection through ultrasonics, uh, calipers, which is the geometry, as well as it uh, gives us what we call the center line of the pipe. So if, if we understand that that center line has moved from one uh, inspection to another, we know that the pipe has shifted. Um, and three different corrosion technologies, uh, magnetic uh, flux leakage, axial flaw detection, and ultrasonic wall measurement. We also do what's called data integration. So we look very carefully in trying to understand whether there's a crack that overlaps with where there might be a dent or a crack-like feature, whether there's a corrosion pit that's in a dent. So we also look at each of those data sets independently and then cohesively to see whether or not any of the features of interest are acting upon one another. We also look through the data for each of those tools to see if each of the tools sees a particular feature differently, and that further expands the knowledge and the use of those tools and further enhances the use of the science. The number of excavations on line 9B have not been determined yet. Uh, we have run uh, the 15 runs already on line 9B. They've taken place mostly in the last uh, eight to 10 weeks and we're now just starting the process of receiving the data back from the ILI vendors, and that will take a number of months uh, into the future. We anticipate you'll start seeing the uh, excavation program associated with uh, 2012 ILI runs starting in January 2013. Any digs that have happened in 2012 uh, would not have been associated with those ILI runs for 2012. They would have been associated with ILI runs of previously uh, runs. That really concludes the big part of the integrity presentation. We've got a number of slides and lots of information uh, in the package, but I think it's probably an appropriate time to uh, um, close off there and, and then open it up for questions. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Uh, any questions at this point? We have Councillors uh, McCaddy and then Clark. So Councillor McCaddy and then Clark. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and, and first off, I want to thank uh, Enbridge for coming uh, today and bringing the expertise that they've, they've done to, uh, to Hamilton. Uh, it shows a lot of respect for the City Council, and I, I for one, uh, greatly appreciate uh, your uh, deputations today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to, to begin by uh, talking about the process, because uh, I think it's, it's always important for us to, as we decide how we're going to respond or intervene or, or take action of some, some type, we need to understand the process so we don't miss any opportunities. Um, so uh, I have a motion, as you know, Mr. Deputy Mayor, later on, and, and attached to that is, a, is a, a letter from Enbridge to the National Energy Board dated October 11th, 2012. And this letter was sent to me by, uh, by the Environmental Defense uh, Organization. Uh, I think Matt uh, spoke on their behalf earlier on. Uh, so I just wanted to understand the uh, the timing of this and, and what the what the letter says, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So I don't know who would be the best person to answer that, but I'll pose a couple of questions if I can. Uh, so first of all, the um, the intent of, of what uh, type of oil will be flowed through this uh, this pipeline, and I understand, and it's important for us to understand that uh, Enbridge is not the oil company here. Enbridge is the the uh, organization that would uh, that would carry the the product, so it's not entirely their decision uh, on what uh, product would be flowed through the through the pipeline. But based on their conversations with uh, with their customers, and uh, looking at this letter, which I I take as a as a heads up that they're going to uh, uh, come back to the National Energy Board and apply uh, for uh, 
additional flows. Uh, I think they refer to it as a pre-application uh, information. What uh, can you tell us? What uh, type of uh, oil will be flowed through the pipeline? Uh, would be question one. Uh, specifically, obviously, the concern is uh, is Dilbit, uh, and then the uh, the timing of the mm -hmm. application that you'll make to uh, to flow uh, the heavier oil, and it's it's all language, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll just call it Dilbit for argument's sake, and then the additional barrels per day that will be flowed, uh, the application will go through. So just a sense of timing, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, the, the type of product and, and the timing of the application that will go into the National Energy Board, please. Who would like to uh, answer that question? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to address your uh, question around product uh, first, and then I'll let one of my colleagues address the process. Um, uh, as from the information that's been provided to Enbridge from our shippers, um, there is uh, the application will include uh, a range of products, as uh, Ken Hall has already uh, spoken to. Um, it, they said it's predominantly uh, the lighter crudes, but the application will include the ability to ship uh, diluted bitumen on the line. And, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it may not be a fair question, but <clears throat> I'll ask it anyways. Um, uh, it, in fact, do you have confirmation? Can you confirm that uh, Dilbit will be uh, will be flowed through this line? A diluted bitumen, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Can you confirm that? It will be in our application. So, uh, and, and our uh, our products uh, quality specification will include the allowance for that. So, at the end of the day, uh, then it's the shippers that actually uh, nominate volumes on a uh, daily basis out through a month and, and through the through the year, but they actually nominated in batches, so I can't tell you specifically how much will flow each day or each week or each month, but the application will allow for uh, diluted bitumen to flow in the line. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, so the, uh, the process question then, I guess, uh, uh, we have this letter before us today, the October 11th letter. And I think I heard Ken say that there'll be a, an, an, uh, an actual application going in at the end of November. Uh, so maybe just to confirm that. And uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, this council is not familiar with the National Energy Board process, and that's part of my uh, motion to ask staff to investigate that. But I suspect Enbridge is quite familiar uh, with the National, National Energy Board process. You're in that business. So I wonder if you could uh, take us through that process. When will the application be put in? What type of application is it? Uh, and, and how would the uh, National Energy Board treat that application in terms of process? And of course, our interest today, City of Hamilton, uh, should we should Council decide to intervene? What uh, what an intervention by us would mean? Uh, how long do we have uh, if you put your application in the end of November or whenever uh, you tell us uh, it'll be going in? Just a sense of the process, please, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, yes, we will be filing an application with the National Energy Board at the end of November. Um, we filed this pre-application information for the NEB's purposes so that they could start the process for their own internal purposes, so they knew what was coming and they could start the process running for things like participant funding. The National Energy Board process, it, uh, we will be filing an application pursuant to what is called a Section 58. It's, a, it's an application for uh, um, facilities. All the, fac all the work will be done on station property, um, and with the accept exception of some work on a densitometer, but the, um, the work is all being done on station property. The um, process will be that once the National Energy Board makes an, uh, receives the application, they will make a determination on completeness of the application. Um, we have we that's within their timing. All every, once we make our application, everything is within their power for timing, and we have no influence over that. They will make a decision on the the um, completeness of the application, and after that, they will issue a hearing order. The hearing order is a document that contains information about the issues that will be discussed. There's a minor description of the project. It talks about the scope of the project, and it talks about the process that will be followed in the consideration 
of this uh, application. We fully expect that they will set this down for an oral public hearing. They don't legally have to, but we, f we are fully expecting that. Um, if they do set it down for an oral public hearing, there will also be an opportunity for participant funding. They will issue a letter that, um, and also publish in newspapers so that people that want to apply for participant funding may do so. Participant funding is available to non-governmental organizations, um, Aboriginal groups, landowners, uh, not-for-profits. It's not available for governments or industry associations uh, or, or for-profit organizations. Um, the hearing order will set out all the steps, and one of the steps will be that people that want to participate actively in the hearing can file an intervention. And there's a form on the NEB website that you can use to just check off the boxes and give your contact name. Once you file an intervention, you have full rights to participate in the hearing. You can ask written questions of Enbridge, you can file evidence, you can come to the hearing and, and um, cross-examine any party in the hearing and you can present argument at the end of the hearing. The other way of participating is by writing a letter of comment, and that can be written and filed with the board, and the timing for that will also be set out in the hearing order. There may be an opportunity for oral comments at the hearing. I don't know, that's up to the board to determine whether they want to allow that. After interventions are filed, then there will be the process just quickly, and I've, I've set some of this out in our slides, but the process will be that Enbridge will file um, any additional evidence which, based on what the board listed in their list of issues in the hearing order, then people will be able to write, uh, ask us in information requests, which are written questions that they can send to Enbridge. We will respond to them. Interveners then file their evidence, then there are information requests to the interveners, responses to those, and then we end up at the oral, oral hearing where there's cross-examination and argument. The board will then uh, reserve its decision and issue it within about uh, 12 weeks, usually. Uh, that's their service standard of the date of the uh, end of the hearing. Thanks okay, very on much. On that point, uh, just point of clarification, yeah. uh, I presume you're Marjorie I'm Folk? sorry, Marjorie Folk, yes, okay. F-O-W-K-E. Council Regulatory Affairs, is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right, thank you. Yes, Councilor thanks, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor. So th thanks very much for that, a very comprehensive answer. Um, so it sounds, uh, sounds like the sort of the, the clock starts ticking when the, uh, when the, minister, when the uh, Energy Board uh, uh, goes through the check to make sure everything's complete. And they uh, they issue something in the newspapers often, by the sounds of it. Uh, and and how do we get on a list to be notified that if we've we've got 60 days or 30 days or whatever the number is in order to intervene and, and put our uh, our uh, our step into the process? Uh, and I appreciate because uh, this because it it's something that we don't know. Sure. Um, the NEB will advertise for participant funding, and then as part of the hearing order, they will order us to place ads in the newspaper all along the right-of-way with respect to the hearing and the process for the hearing. And so we will do that in both languages all across, all along the right-of-way of the, of the pipeline. Um, we would be happy to add you to a list to make sure that, that the City of Hamilton gets a copy of the hearing order when it's issued. But there will be newspapers, or there will be ads in, in the newspapers. Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's very important that we do be added to, uh, I guess, the mayor and all members of council probably would be the letter uh, to address, and that would come to council. And Because we didn't receive a copy of this October 11th uh, uh, letter directly, and it would be nice to, to have that uh, so we have it directly. <coughs> Uh, that would be great. Thanks very much. That's the questions I have on process. Okay, and if I could, sir, um, your staff, I've, I've put a lot of links in the presentation for where to look for information. And the National Energy Board's process is generally a, um, information pull rather than information push. So everything is on the NEB website. All the documents that we file will be there. And we encourage people to, that that's a great place to look for information, including process information. There's also, I've included the name um, and email of a process advisor at the National Energy Board if you have any questions about the process of the NEB pro um, proceedings that will happen. They, that person is very um, able to help you and that's what they're there for. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know, um, I have a number of technical questions uh, and I don't want to take up too much more time here. Uh, maybe I'll ask the questions and I suspect others will be asking similar questions and, and Enbridge may want to, uh, That's fine. If, if I can carry on then. Just, uh, just on the um, 
obviously a lot of the questions that we heard uh, from folks, the delegates, and typically you hear all the time, I'm sure, is is the, cro the cross corrosive nature of the uh, of the diluted bitumen that some people feel is the case. And so I just wanted to clarify some of the comments you made. The, there's um, I'll just go down a quick list here. There's, you said there's no sand in the product. Uh, there's no increase in pressure, or or no increase in maximum operating pressure. Those, those may be two different things. Uh, versus the current pressures in the line. There's no temperature change. The um, the capacity, I, I think, is changing from whatever it is now to 300,000 barrels per day. I think I read that in the, the letter that you sent uh, in October. Um, and you said there's no difference in shipping light crude versus diluted bitumen in terms of some of the integrity questions. Uh, and, and there's no additional water uh, in the line which of course would be a corrosive concern. There's a limit of 0.5% uh, and, and a limit for sediment and water, which is the, the corrosive uh, issue, I would think. Um, and I was going to ask about the Kalamazoo experience. You haven't referred to that specifically, the Marshall, um, Michigan experience. Uh, you did say it was not an internal corrosive uh, issue on the pipeline itself, uh, which is good to hear. You, you mentioned the state-of-the-art control center in Edmonton. Um, so I'm just trying to understand uh, what, if it wasn't the pipe uh, and there's a state-of-the-art control center in Edmonton, what, what happened in Kalamazoo, or in Marshall, Michigan, rather, and what learnings uh, would we be happy to hear uh, and feel comfortable that you might reflect in, uh, in your Hamilton or, or your Line 9 experience. Uh, and the last question I had was a different question, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, based on Mr. McGreal's uh, earlier question. The line 10, uh, uh, just understanding the spill that occurred in 2000, which I, is probably the only spill in the Hamilton area, as far as I know, and uh, any plans for line 10, which I understand goes goes down to, through Buffalo, uh, and any any plans because that would also be a Hamilton issue, Glanbrook uh, uh, to the uh, to to that end of Hamilton. So sorry, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I thought I'd get all those out and uh, and uh, seek some. Uh, Answers to those. Okay, who would like to uh, to take on those questions? Um, I can address the. Uh, Your name, sir. Just I'm sorry. It's Graham White. I'm the business communications manager for uh, Enbridge um, Pipelines and Liquids. Um, I uh, I can speak to the Kalamazoo uh, Marshall incident uh, just because it's something that I have uh, familiar familiarity with probably more than than these uh, these people. We have regional people uh, in the U.S. that um, are certainly the uh, the greatest specialists on that uh, particular incident, but um, the the information of it not being corrosive internally was is is a result of our investigation. It's also the result of the NTSB investigation. They very clearly stated um, that it was not an internal corrosion issue. Um, the it was obviously an incredibly significant event, not just for the uh, community and for the people that were affected, uh, but for Enbridge as well. Um, we, we took it uh, obviously very, very seriously. We um, uh, responded to it. Um, we, we are still responding to it, as has been, uh, has been um, uh, detailed, and, and we certainly don't dispute that. We are in the uh, community of Marshall. We have been uh, since, the, since the incident, and we will continue to be probably forever, but certainly until um, every single um, uh, expectation of us is, uh, has been fulfilled. Um, and uh, we are, the, what we learned from that uh, incident ha, there were, were tremendous. We, we had uh, tremendous learnings from that and it's important also to identify that the NTSB in many cases was, was referring to um, much of what uh, Enbridge was leading up to that. And we feel that we were a responsible company leading up to that and we did dispute uh, some of the findings of, of the NTSB. Our, our CEO said that um, for example, uh, that if we felt that we had information that, that we should have been addressing the integrity of that pipe, we certainly would have. We feel that the information that, that we received was um, had some issues, but we, again, take full responsibility. That having been said, we take full responsibility uh, for that incident. And the $800 million, by the way, that is cited as the cost of the spill was our cost. Um, so. Uh, that risk is uh, certainly a risk that is taken by the communities, and we don't de de deny that. However, we do everything in our, pro in our uh, power to mitigate that risk and also to assume it um, on, uh, financially in any other way that we possibly can when an unfortunate incident like this does occur. 
Um, improvements that we've made have been multitudinous. Uh, we have uh, made vast improvements in our inline inspection and integrity uh, processes and procedures. Uh, we've made improvements in our, we have a, not just a, a better control center and monitoring, but a, a brand new state of the art, uh, much better um, uh, state, uh, control center. Um, that's based in Edmonton that 24-7 monitors all of our lines. Um, it has a much better uh, uh, system, softwares, and procedures for detecting all kinds of uh, incidents, but in including leaks. Um, we have made uh, improvements, in as, and Trevor went over these uh, somewhat, but in terms of our, this is the always evolving technology, um, so we are always making uh, uh, headway in terms of, of improving our technology um, and, and monitoring to, uh, to all kinds of, of um, uh, features that he was talking about that, we, that may need um, response to, including integrity. We've increased our integrity digs uh, in the area of, of hundreds of millions of dollars um, so that we have much better knowledge of all of our lines, but including line nine. Um, and we have, uh, uh, and, and again, we have also very much increased our, our right-of-way um, exchange of information with our, our right-of-way stakeholders, landowners, um, et cetera, so that they have a, a, a much higher awareness uh, and they, are, they know, uh, they have a level of, of knowledge to, um, of what a spill looks like, what it smells like, that type of thing. So there have been many measures that we have uh, undertaken to uh, become a better company um, and a more responsive and, and um, uh, a better company since that incident. If there's any technical, specific technical matters, Trevor, you want to... Uh, my name is Scott Ironside. I uh, just wanted to address maybe some of your first questions in regards to operating pressures, uh, characteristics of the crude oils and whatnot. So uh, the, the pipeline systems are designed uh, and uh, have a tariff limit or maximum on a number of the characteristics you described, such as the temperature, the uh, density of the product, the viscosity, uh, those types of critical things. And so... Um, as was stated earlier, we don't know from uh, a month-to-month -month basis what the, uh, the shippers, our customers, are interested in moving uh, crude oil from one place to another. Uh, there's trends, of course, and the, and the refineries are, are able to handle certain types of crude, so we, we obviously can predict and have uh, uh, trends to understand that. But uh, from time to time, there is opportunity for them to change the, the crude oil that they are interested in, in uh, receiving or moving through our system. So when we talk about a, a not changing a temperature or not changing a maximum operating pressure, what we're describing is that the system was designed and uh, approved through to our tariffs and specifications, and from time to time, we may or may not need to operate the pipeline system at those uh, specification levels. And so when we talk about not requiring a need to change the maximum operating pressure, uh, that's the, the, the reality of, uh, of, of the, um, the operation of the system, is that uh, the, the previous maximum operating pressure will be maintained uh, regardless of, of what the customers or our shippers are, are requiring. And uh, so uh, from, a, from a diluted bitumen perspective, the the, the differential between that and any other crude oil, there are a number of, uh, um, I guess, uh, information packets there's, uh, uh, which we can provide for you, but there's uh, crude quality uh, uh, information on, on some websites that can, can describe to you some of the differences. However, what, what, what Trevor was trying to maintain... Sorry, excuse me. So what Trevor was trying to describe is that uh, uh, all of those crude oils have a specification of 0.5% of sediment and water that is a maximum uh, that if, it, uh, through our testing, if we were to discover that, we would shut out a customer if they were producing, uh, pr providing something like that to us. And so uh, uh, in, in, in those ways, Dilbit is really no different than any other crude oil. They maintain the specifications that were required uh, we're requiring of our customers to provide to us uh, as we ship the, the oil. Councillor McKetty? Just a quick follow-up. The, um, so the, the onus is really on the, the suppliers to, uh, the shippers, I guess you use that term, to uh, provide a product to you that, that uh, uh, is, meets those kind of standards, the 0.5% uh, 
solids and moisture uh, being below that. Um, so I, somebody checks it at their end, obviously, and is there a government check? Uh, and then, of course, you would check it as well before it goes into your pipeline. Uh, just just a, so the due diligence on that, if you could just touch on that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Sure. So, yes, you're correct. The, the customer or our shipper would be uh, uh, checking the products that they're moving into our system. We would, in turn, be uh, testing uh, the batch of oil that's coming through from them to us, and we would monitor uh, the quality of that through our systems as well. And the, the Montreal refineries, how many are there, and, and they're all set up to handle Dilbit, are they, Mr. Deputy Mayor? I'd have to look to Ken probably to answer that. Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor McCaddy, to answer your question, there used to be seven refineries in Montreal East. There's only one now. Um, six of them have shut down over the past 20 years. Um, it's been somewhat of an economic crisis for the city of Montreal East, as you can imagine, because they've lost some of the best paying jobs they had in that community. This was certainly a topic of discussion when we met with the provincial government in Quebec and with the municipal government in the city of Montreal. Um, the one remaining refinery is owned and operated by Suncor. It used to be a Petrocan facility. Suncor purchased Petrocan's assets. The second refinery in the province of Quebec is owned and operated by Ultramar, and as I indicated, is located in Lévis, across the St. Lawrence River from the city of Quebec City. So that, uh, the, the Suncor refinery in Montreal East has a limited capacity to refine heavy crude. Uh, which would include, under definition, diluted bitumen. Uh, as mentioned, and as you've mentioned to us today, the, the plan for the capacity of this uh, pipeline once reversed is 300,000 barrels a day. Um, a small fraction of that amount could be heavy crude variety based on the capacity receipt or the capabilities, if you will, of Suncor to take that kind of material. Um, will, will there be activities by Suncor to maximize that? Probably, because of the economic viability of doing so. Suncor can handle it. Ultramar can't. Uh, Ultramar is currently um, set up to refine offshore crudes that they've been receiving predominantly from the North Sea. So they have been asking us, to, at this point in time, they have asked us to ship them predominantly light material that's being sourced out of the Bakken Formation in Saskatchewan and North Dakota. So, and the, again, uh, to clarify, not from the oil sands. Right. And then the uh, remaining, if there was remaining shipping going on, it would go down to the U.S. following your pipeline? Is that what would occur? No. There is absolutely no intention to pursue any exports of oil on the Line 9 reversal project, as was referenced this morning, the Trail Breaker project, which Enbridge did look at in 2008, has been shelved since 2009. Very simple reason for that. Our competitor has looked at a more direct option of shipping Western Canadian crude to the eastern seaboard of the United States. It's called the Keystone Project. It's a project that is currently being debated and is being managed by TransCanada Pipelines. It is no longer economically viable to send crude oil through Montreal to Portland, Maine to return it to Texas. It just doesn't make business sense to do that. All of the oil that we're looking at shipping east on Line 9 is to service the needs of refineries in Quebec. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, I guess the last question I had was on line 10. Uh, when we heard uh, from uh, Mr. McGreal that there was a spill there in 2000, 2001, and, and any, any action on line 10 then? Uh, Actually, I'm going to defer that question to Mr. Pruger. Uh, Mr. Pruger is the supervisor of operations at our Westover facility and was personally involved in responding to that incident. Good morning or good afternoon now. Uh, my name is Franz Berger. I'm the area supervisor at Westover. Just okay. to correct Ken, I, w I was not involved directly with that spill, but um, I am the uh, area supervisor that where the spill occurred in. Um, okay. That happened in 2001. So just wondering, just a quick characteristic of where Line 10 goes. So we, we know lots about Line 9 now, or we're learning about Line 9. But Line 10, uh, it, it goes through... Uh, Clambrook Westover does it and it somehow it ends up down towards Buffalo and is there any is that light crude or uh, no one here has talked about line 10 uh, of that spill why why that spill happened if anyone knows here today uh, that uh, that line runs basically from our station at Westover which is uh, in Flamborough and the line runs down through uh, 
uh, through the city of Hamilton, um, up on top of the mountain, and down towards uh, uh, Buffalo. And it, uh, we deliver it to uh, Tonawanda, uh, to the Kayetone uh, pipeline, which still reserve the oil to the United Refinery in Pennsylvania. And uh, there's different, very different types of crude oil in that. Uh, there is some heavy crudes right now that's being uh, delivered down that line. And should we read heavy crude as diluted bitumen? Is, are those the two, are they the same thing? Uh, no, it's just uh, heavy crude from, from Alberta. Two different things. So there's no diluted bit, bitumen going through line 10? Not that I'm aware of. No, and no future plans. I mean, there's no applications before the National Energy Board or anticipated for any changes to line 10. Just to, just to help Mr. McGreal out uh, and our colleagues in uh, Glanbrook. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Them. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I could just say that if the tariff, and I haven't looked at the Line 10 tariff recently, but if the tariff allowed for heavy, then it allows anything that meets those specifications. So, and, and I don't know what the Line 10 tariff, I haven't looked at it recently. Yeah. It could be diluted bitumen. We'd have to verify, you'd, you'd have to verify that. Uh, yeah. Okay, and and any, any sense of why that spill happened? Was that a, a pipeline integrity issue, or does anybody know offhand? Uh, it's Scott Ironside again. I, I can uh, answer that. So the, uh, the, the condition that uh, resulted in the failure there was uh, an external corrosion uh, feature. And uh, it was uh, actually right, very close to a, a valve uh, along the pipeline. Are you fine? No, with that? All right. Thank you, Councillor uh, McCaddy. Now we have Councillors uh, Clark and then Pearson. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm going to try not to repeat questions. Feel free to say, uh, Brad, we already heard that one. So, because it's been a lot of excellent questions from Councillor McCaddy. Um, a moment ago, we had these three bottles of lovely liquid pass by. Um, if you could imagine all of the different types of oil lined up, so light crude, crude, um, all the way through to, to diluted bitum, um, heavy crude, each one of those. Is it the position of Enbridge that all of those different chemical compositions of oil, because they are slightly different in composition, have the exact same corrosivity? Uh, so uh, corrosivity is a, an interesting word, and, and certainly in the way that it's being used uh, recently, um, when we talk about the corrosivity of a crude oil, um, recall that uh, in, in many ways crude oil is used as, a, as an anti-corrosive uh, product for carbon steels. Uh, your engine oil, it helps keep the, uh, the pistons moving, but it also aids in uh, anti-corrosion. So from an oil corrosivity perspective, oil is not corrosive. The uh, potential for corrosion inside a pipeline is related to um, the water and sediments that may or may not exist and whether or not they drop out of that uh, product into your pipeline. And so when we talk about the corrosivity of a crude oil, uh, generally speaking, crude oils are non-corrosive and there are uh, measurements uh, through ASTM standards that are being developed to try and, um, I guess, quantify the corrosivity of that? So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to be clear, the definition of corrosivity that Enbridge is using is it has to have water and sand in it. I'm talking about the chemical compositions of the different oils. Does the pH or are they acidic? Does it change in any way, shape, or form? I know in our sewer system we have to be very careful what exactly is going through our sewer system because if we change the pH just slightly, it starts to eat away our pipes. So sure. I'm trying to understand. I understand about water and sand, and I don't think anyone around here would say, well, yep, that's not corrosive. We all know it is. The differences in chemical compositions is there a difference in chemical composition that can cause over time a change in the integrity of the pipe? So at the, at the temperatures we operate at and uh, the conditions we operate under, uh, all of the crude oils have a, what I would say is a similar corrosivity. And does the temperature change on your pipe? Uh, the, the temperature, uh, the, 
the, the act of moving the oil uh, by uh, increasing pressure at a pump station, the friction of the fluid moving down the pipeline uh, does create heat and there is a heat loss uh, associated with the movement of the oil. So uh, yes, there is uh, an increase and decrease of the temperature of the crude oil as it moves down the system. Uh, all what we would call uh, marginal amounts, uh, we're talking 5, 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, change 5, 10 degrees uh, variation that you might see uh, Celsius. So, and again, my understanding, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I guess I'm going to use the term viscosity of the different oil products. Each one would move down the pipe in different ways. So if you have to heat it up to make it move smoother, that's when you would heat it? Or is it uh, the friction no, of the oil? In, in would... fact, it's, it's just the natural action of moving the oil. We don't, uh, uh, we don't have heating as a, as a as a tool to uh, reduce the viscosity of the oil. Uh, Your tariff that you would have with the National Energy Board would indicate the maximum pressure that's allowable, operating pressure, for each particular um, refined product. So it, does it change for each type? For example, um, light crude or crude or heavy crude, would you would have a higher pressure to push that through in a heavier crude? Uh, no. So the tariff uh, sorry, the, um, the agreement with the National Energy Board through the application of the uh, facility would have a single maximum operating pressure defined for that pipe. And then uh, whatever the crude or product is being moved through it would have to uh, be within that limitation. So it's not going to be a, a crude or a product specific maximum operating pressure. So um, when I'm thinking of a thicker material moving through the pipe and you have a maximum operating pressure and you, you cannot exceed that, if you were now using a much thinner crude, would you not be shipping a lot more volume through that pipe if you were maxing it? Fundamental hydraulics, yes. So absolutely that would be the case. Um, yeah. So if you're bouncing around, and forgive me for asking these questions because I'm trying to understand how these breaks happen. And, and one of the variables that seem to be confusing to me is if you're operating um, pressure is say, say 500 um, um, cubic per meters cubed uh, or kilograms per meter cubed uh, for one particular product and now your maximum is m much higher and you're shipping that lighter crude at the maximum height or volume and pressure, isn't there more risk of an explosive failure when you have something that's not going to gum up, it's just going to go blow if it breaks open? Uh, there was a lot of question in there. I think your, my, my understanding is you deliver the crude based on what your customers are, your, or the oil based on what your customers are wanting. Correct. So in any specific day, could you be moving around the product in terms of whether or not it's it's a higher viscosity or lower viscosity oil, or do you just ship it one week we're shipping light crude, the next week we're shipping something else? How does it sure. work? Sure. So, so how it works is, and you know, as I said earlier, you know, we we uh, we would schedule the pipeline based off the nominations process, and and we would schedule the pipeline out on a monthly basis, and generally speaking, we would have uh, the, the what we call batches of crude that would be um, generally in the order of 10,000 cubic meters. And depending on the diameter of the pipe, uh, that could be four or five miles in length. So you have four or five miles of, of, of the same crude type. And so that, um, generally speaking, we line up our, our pipeline system to have like commodities in them uh, for reasons like you described to maintain uh, consistent uh, pressures required to move the, the crude. So you're not but, making any dramatic shifts from one crude product to a light crude. My concern is if you're pumping at maximum at um, a light crude and now you switch it to the heavier crude, that's going to put significant torque and stress on the entire system. So to answer that, generally speaking, we keep the crudes of a similar type on that line. Now. There can be examples where uh, we may go to certain refineries and switch to another refinery that requires a heavier crude. So there is a potential for uh, moving a, a number of batches of a lighter product 
for, for quality control purposes, we prefer not to have a heavy lined up with a very light crude because there's intermixing and there's crude quality issues to manage. So uh, normally we would have a light mixed, uh, 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 matched up with a medium or so something of that nature. So exactly. So that you keep your. Uh, uh, you're never on. really mixing a light, one, shipping a light one day and then a heavy the next day. It's going to be feathered through. So there's a that's, gradual. Change. That's the normal program. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was interested in my last question, line of questions, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I was interested in hearing that you've had 15 inlines. I'm using your terms, not my term. Um, so far on pipeline nine. And I believe I heard that it would be a number of months before you get the results of those uh, fancy tests back. Do you have an idea how long it'll take for those results to come back? Because you know, I haven't done any excavation work yet because you don't know what's going on in the pipeline yet. Is that a fair statement? Uh, it's close. Uh, so we do know what's going on in the pipeline from previous inline inspections. So these aren't the first set of inspections. We've been inspecting line nine since uh, the late 70s. Yeah, the late 70s, uh, with various technologies as they've developed through the through the decades. So uh, the recent inspections, as Trevor stated, were completed in the in the past few months. Uh, the uh, the amount of data that's collected uh, in these uh, inspections is uh, very large. The analysis process that the uh, inline inspection vendors go through is uh, uh, very elaborate and deliberate. Um, they uh, they will go through and assess on a on a millimeter by millimeter basis the condition of the pipeline, and they would then report that back to us. So uh, some uh, technologies have a, a shorter time frame to do the analysis. So uh, Trevor mentioned we have a magnetic flux leakage is a, a technology uh, that measures uh, corrosion. Uh, those reports generally come quicker. Uh, and the ultrasonic tools, uh, they typically take a little bit longer time. Uh, so uh, we have received some of those reports. They're going through our internal processes right now for evaluation of, uh, of what the, the, the tools uh, have seen. And uh, as Trevor mentioned, some of the digs will be starting in January. I'm just going to use an analogy, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, a friend of mine was getting an MRI. Uh, for nasty headaches, and it, he was told it was going to take three months before he got the results from a specialist. His statement was, hell, I could be dead before they tell me what's wrong. Um, if it's going to take that many months to find out what's going on in the pipeline, then how isn't there a, a risk of a breach to the pipeline if it takes you three months to sort out which pipes you're going to excavate? Like, I don't understand that process. So, well, right, so the, the timing of doing the inspections is something that we, uh, we wouldn't leave until the last minute. So as I said earlier, we have previous inspections on, on the pipeline. And so uh, really this is a, an updating of that information. And so there's no risk and change from one inspection to the other? Uh, certainly there is, and that's why we do the reinspection. So uh, the planning for those reinspections, though, depending on the type of uh, inspection that's being done, is designed to happen long before uh, any of the known features in the pipeline would become critical at operating pressures. How would you know if there's a major fault? A major fault. Oh, something's wrong. You're doing these assessments three months before you actually find out what's going on. How do you, I'm sorry, I, I'm having a rough time figuring this one out. So, so based on the previous inspections, we would do fine. We you just said the last ones were fine. So now this is a new round, and an inspection and result indicates there is a, a fine fault in the pipe that could potentially grow, and it's not going to be for three months before you know. So, so we would time the inspections based on modeling of particular flaw growth rates. So, for example, if a, if there's known corrosion feature, we would. Uh, model the the rate at which it would be growing, and we would time our inspections to ensure that it hap the inspections happen before that uh, corrosion would become critical at the operating pressure. Section of the community is based on commu computer modeling as opposed to real time. Uh, well, it's it's more than just commu computer modeling. There's a lot of uh, um, engineering and analysis that goes into it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, can I?
Something for the record, um, in a previous meeting, one of my colleagues had indicated that Enbridge had met with the majority, if not all, of the councillors. I don't meet with lobbyists. I never have met with lobbyists. They did not meet with me, and I don't think Councillor Pearson met with them either. Thank you. I think it's unanimous that they didn't meet with anyone. Oh, but, uh, okay. I'm just curious because one of our colleagues said they met with everyone or most of us. So that's a complete change from what the guy from Ancaster. Comment on that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I approached all of council uh, via telephone and or email offering to meet. Um, I met with five councillors. Okay. So, okay. So we do. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, so um, now we have Councillor Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and certainly appreciate all the presenters today and the information. And I may be touching on a question that I think we've tried to get an answer before, but I think goes back to, and you've raised it again, and we keep talking about the, the pipeline system that's closely monitored, the um, state-of-the-art controls. Can you explain exactly what these state-of-the-art controls entail? And the reason I'm asking is, I know like our Horizon Utilities, they can tell they have a whole grid if you go into their the cockpit at Horizon, you have the whole grid of the City of Hamilton, they can tell when blackouts happen in what quadrant. Is this a similar system that Enbridge works with? Could you explain that? <clears throat> so I would preface my comments with I'm, I'm not uh, part of our uh, control center group. However, I'll, I'll answer generally, and if we have to get additional information from that group, we can do so. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, what you described is similar uh, to what we have in our control center in, in a sense that uh, uh, we have uh, monitors established where our operators are continually monitoring the pipeline system. And what they're monitoring is, uh, among other things, the, the operating pressure in the pipe at various locations along the pipeline. They're monitoring the flow rates of the, of the oil uh, at various locations along the, the, the pipeline. And uh, they're also monitoring the... Uh, the density and of the pipe, or sorry, the density of the uh, crude oil that's moving down uh, each individual pipeline. So, um, using that, they can uh, evaluate uh, where each batch is along the pipeline system, so that we can uh, monitor what goes into different uh, tankage and different uh, facilities. Uh, they're also monitoring um, at our terminal facilities the the levels of, of oil in each tank and uh, all of the various uh, elements of, of uh, operating a terminal. Thank you. And um, also wanted to ask then, so you have the centralized in Edmonton, you have your systems through, and I'm assuming it's a system that goes through the pipes just as some of the photographs here show um, sort of tunneling through or equipment that goes through the pipelines and that's how you gather your information, is what I'm assuming, correct? From an integrity perspective, that's correct. So those tools that you see pictures of, those are uh, uh, inserted into the pipeline at specific locations where we have those types of facilities. And that, uh, that tool then travels through the pipeline collecting data. Uh, once that data, uh, sorry, once that tool uh, is received at another facility to re be removed from the pipeline, uh, it's, uh, it's then downloaded and, and analyzed with the ILI vendor. So in a scenario involving our area in Hamilton and the pipeline proposal, reversal and proposal through the Hamilton section. What's the timelines if this is closely monitored on a 24-hour basis? What's the timelines if there is an incident of response in this location? Are there representatives on site within certain jurisdictions at all times? I'll maybe pass that to Franz. Uh, we have uh crews set up right across uh, our eastern region. We have crews in, uh, in Sarnia, at Westover, and Belleville, and in Montreal. Uh, we uh, have uh, all our equipment, we have equipment stationed at Westover, uh, which is all in the city of Hamilton. Um, we have our crews that are on 24-7 uh, on-call and on a pager system so that they respond uh, immediately if there was an incident. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. And I guess I just want to ask um, one question. I, I know part of it was answered. So, um, no, I think that was answered. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you for those. Uh, but I would, if I could preface, so is it possible to get more information on the control center um, group and how that works from Edmonton at some point? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I can provide really whatever information that you require. Just I'd appreciate it, and I think it would be appropriate for all of Council to get that, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank, thank you, you Councilor Pearson. Um, now we have Councilor Pasuda. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Marula, and, and welcome, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you for coming out. Um, a, a few issues here I want to bring up. Um, you're doing integrity digs on line 10. Here I have a folder, and I keep getting all of the information from uh, through clerks here and in Bridge Pipelines uh, from Jasper Avenue, Edmonton, and uh, through the Grand River Conservation. You're asking for permission to do the Conservation is quite involved in, in getting when you have. Um, and I have been to several farms where you've been doing the. Uh, been there, seen inside of the trench. When you find a weak spot in a pipe, uh, find a weak spot, are they usually on the outside or the inside? Uh, generally speaking, uh, the, re the, the weak spot, if you will, uh, is, is going to be an external corrosion feature, so where there may be uh, uh, water accessing the external surface of the pipe and, and creating some corrosion there. Um, or it's uh, potentially a uh, pre-existing flaw in the long seam weld. And uh, I use the term flaw, not necessarily a defect. Uh, what the tools are identifying is a location where there's a potential for a defect to exist. And so uh, that would be visually for, uh, for someone to go and look at the site, you may see absolutely nothing. Um, but as, as Trevor described, we have uh, um, non-destructive testing methods to assess the, 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 the pipe long seam to, to assess a particular flaw that may exist. So generally speaking, that's the type of thing that you're looking at in line 10. And Mr. Deputy, I'm getting a little techy here, and I hope somebody can answer it. If not, so when you when you excavate a weak spot in the pipe, potentially weak spot with air or maintain, you're going to put a sleeve on this. You're going to weld a sleeve on top of this. How do you prepare that surface between? So, and I know a little bit about welding and machine shop stuff. So you've got a pipe, and you've exposed it to repair it to do some maintenance work on it. How do you prepare that pipe? The pipeline is there now before you put the sleeve on. Uh, the process would be to uh, sandblast um, the surface of the, of the pipe and uh, therefore cleaning all contaminants and everything off of that surface. Uh, the, the, the sleeve is then going to be fully welded onto the pipeline. So uh, there's really no other preparation required of the, the pipe that's being covered, uh, given that this sleeve itself would be pressure containing. So in the event that it was an internal uh, type flaw that could potentially grow, uh, if, the, if the sleeve were ever pressurized, it would contain pressure uh, in the pipeline. So uh, the only other thing I would add is the areas where the pipe is being welded, or sorry, the sleeve is being welded onto, uh, those are examined uh, with non-destructive testing methods to ensure that uh, the weld is being put over a, a good surface. Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, can continue. So we had a presenter here today uh, comment that the uh, greater pressure from the oil, 40 to 70 times more the viscosity in the, in the heavy. Act. Um, so when you go from a light crude to a heavy crude, uh, definitely a heavy crude is more viscous. That's fact. Um, but as described earlier, the maximum operating pressure that the pipeline is uh, designed for doesn't change. So if the, um, if the lighter crude is being uh, moved through the pipeline at that pressure, 
you're simply going to have more fluid passing through the pipeline than you would with a higher viscous uh, crude oil. So once again, a little techie here. So a medium, you had samples go around a medium crude. At what pressure would that be moving through uh, pipeline 9B? Uh, well, once again, typically, um, depending on the, the requirements of, the, of the, the shippers, we would typically run the line at or near its maximum pressure uh, regardless of what the crude oil is. Now, it may be that the capacity or the actual volumes that the, the shippers require, uh, require allows us to reduce the operating pressure, but it's simply for a, a functional need as opposed to a desired reduction. A leak or a break. What's your response for the, the area around Westover through Hamilton Flamborough? What would your response be? How is that, uh, how do you have that set up to respond to a break or a leak? So I'll defer that to Franz. So in the event that a, a leak has been detected, and there's many ways to detect a leak uh, through our control center, through the public, um, so once the call, the call will go into our control center, um, and the control center will shut down the, uh, the section of pipe immediately, shuts down the pipeline and, and sectionalizes, it closes the valves. Uh, when that happens, then the calls go out to our uh, regional office in Sarnia, who uh, has somebody on call 24-7. Um, they make the call uh, to uh, myself in the Westover area. And at that point, we dispatch uh, crews to verify that there is a leak. Um, we get order calls uh, quite often, and, and uh, they typically don't, uh, there are nothing, um, or, or possibly a gas leak or whatever, somebody's house or whatever. But So we have to verify that uh, a leak has, has occurred. A lot of times you can tell, uh, the control center can tell uh, just by operating the line that whether it is a leak or whatever. and. Uh, but we'll verify it. We'll also, at that point, uh, call in all the crews uh, to come to Westover to pick up all the equipment, as well as we'll be uh, calling in, uh, emergency response contractors that we have on retainers, as well, to assist uh, with the response. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to contain it. Um, and once we've contained it, then we're going to start cleaning it up. Uh, and one more question, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Do you or have you ever provided a security or a bond to any municipality for pipelines running through properties? Um, so, yeah, not that we're aware of, but um, uh, we would generally we would not do that. But I mean, and again, when you look at um, the uh, costs that we have put out for cleanup in, uh, in, in our incidents in the past, we've always had the resources um, to provide whatever it takes in order in terms of money or, or whatever else to respond to that. So Enbridge takes full responsibility, does not cost municipality any dollars whatsoever for cleanup, securities, um, things like that? Yeah, that's correct. And in fact, if you uh, go to the communities, including Marshall, where this event has happened, that they can confirm that. Okay. However, I mean, the cost, that's monetarily. There's other costs, of course. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, now we have Councillor Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and um, a lot of good questions around uh, the horseshoe today. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming in. Uh, it's a good presentation, and I've certainly, uh, I've certainly had my eyes opened. I've, I've learned a lot today. I'm not going to repeat the questions that have been asked, but I just have one, and I listened very carefully to all the questions and the answers, so um, forgive me if I've missed this. But could you please explain the, the process? I, I understand from what I heard before that your schedules for shipping the crude through the pipeline are done on a monthly basis. Is that correct through you, Deputy Mayor? That's, that's correct. Uh, typically, our shippers uh, will uh, nominate how many batches and, and the volume of each of the batches for the next month. 
Okay, thank you. And just to further cl clarify, I, I understood that you would ship the same type of crude, the batches all together in one line. So if you were shipping light, it would be just light within a certain line over a period of time. Is that correct? So once all the batches or all the, all the nominations have been received for the next month, we look at that series of nominations and try to best logistically uh, keep the viscosities the same for operational, uh, I guess, performance, as well as we have to work with each of our shippers to make sure they've got the tankage and, and the capacity to also blend into the, the big scheme. So they not only need volumes, but they need volumes at a certain rate in a certain sequence so that they can meet their product needs as well. All right, thank you. So at, at what point or, or is there ever a change when you've, you've shipped for you know, a certain volume of, let's say, light crude oil? If you were then to go to a medium or a heavy crude, would it be shipped in that same pipeline uh, in a different schedule? And if it is, is, could you explain the process for any cleaning um, so that there isn't kind of a contamination from one crude to another? Uh, certainly all the products, we're, we're talking about one pipeline. So uh, on line nine, it's, it ships a series of different products to three different end, end destinations. And so those three end, end destinations have individual requirements. They don't each take one product. They'll take a series of mixed products as well. So they're all going down the same pipeline. Uh, some of our uh, products, they have what they call batch pigs, which is a physical separator between one product and the next product. Other products, you uh, are able to maintain uh, a minimum uh, interstitial mix of the products in the line and can ship them sequentially, and there's very little blend or transition in the pipeline. All right, thank you very much for that explanation. I, I appreciate it, and I, I think that was probably the one question that I did not hear asked, and uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, one comment I want to feed back, just because I'm up here at the moment, but I'm not sure we were fully uh, clarified the, the one question. Even with viscosity, that is one of the parameters that's in the specification on the lines. So. You, you have to keep all the products you're going to ship within not only a, not only a product quality from the point of view of 0.5% uh, solids and water mixture as well as other properties, but one of those other properties is viscosity. So there is a tolerance for what viscosity can be from the heaviest to the lightest. So the heaviest has to be brought up to a certain viscosity to allow it to be shippable. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Partridge. Uh, there are no further questions, so I, uh, so I have a motion. But I thank you very much for, for your input, Councillor McCaddy. You can move your motion now or later. We're going to break now and perhaps do that later, but yeah. it's, up, it's up to you. Sorry, uh, Councillor Marula, or Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, just in my, in my motion, which I think can I share a copy with you, uh, there were three questions or, or requests for information from, uh, from Enbridge. I probably should have just asked those here or just maybe uh, verified whether those are <clears throat> uh, questions uh, that we can ask. And the first one was the results of the pipeline integrity digs uh, conducted on Line 9 in Flamborough. The second one is how Enbridge can assist on monitoring drinking, drinking water wells in the Line 9 pipeline area. And the third was the emergency response plan in case of a spill. I think Councillor Pasuda touched on that third one. So uh, we, we had planned on asking you those questions via this motion. So I don't, I don't know if you wanted to touch on any of those today or just uh, maybe uh, we'll just go ahead and do that if you don't mind and you'll get a letter from us, I guess, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, asking those questions uh, formally. Is, is that appropriate, uh, Ken? Yes, Councillor McCaddy, that would be appreciated. The formal request will be dealt with. Let's go ahead and do that later on, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor McCaddy. No, no further speakers. I appreciate your time. Moved by Partridge, second by Pursuit, that we received the presentation. All in favor? Yeah. Carried. Now, before we go to break, we're, we're going to have an issue this afternoon. Um, but we can't. I, I have a speaking engagement at Delta High School for 1.30. We are at a bare quorum now at 9. We've been in and out of quorum all, after, all day. So the issue is this, I have um, a speaking engagement at 1.30, I have cable 14, 
that's been scheduled. All of this was scheduled prior to this meeting being scheduled. Having said that, um, we're, we're going to have an issue. Um, this meeting probably inevitably might be canceled because others are suggesting they have to leave as well. So, Madam Clerk, uh, could you just uh, verify that uh, everyone that committed to here today is here today? Sorry, through, through the chair, the meeting can continue as long as we have a quorum. Once we lose quorum, the meeting will be re either recessed to continue at another time or adjourned. Okay, now I will be re returning after uh, the Cable 14 commitment, so hopefully we can re retain quorum until that point. Um, uh, uh, so we're going to break now. We lose quorum if we, if we I've got, I must leave for the speaking engagement. But uh, Councillor Morali must leave as well. So we need to break now to try to regroup, come back in, in uh, let's say, a half an hour. Okay. I move to cancel Council Marula's appointments. <laughs> well, see, the problem is it's Delta High School. It's a group of students. It's speaking here. I I, I've already canceled once. I think. Uh, I move to take a break. Okay. Moved by Partridge, seconded by Patina. All in favor? Carried. How long, Mr. Deputy Mayor? We used to have to have an hour.